can I start the Professor Ayman will live. Yes. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all my vascular family along the universe. It's nice to meet you again in our webinar session. I'm honored to welcome you all in our meeting today. First, I would like to thank Sigvers Group for supervising and sponsoring this meeting. And I am honored and really feel in depth to our speakers today, Dr. Homan Jalei, Dr. Raoul Jindal, and Dr. Mahmoud Bishir. And I want to welcome the great panel, Dr. Lowell Kabnik from the United States, Dr. Eberhard Rapé from Netherlands, Dr. Sergio from Italy, Dr. Khafir Serlet from Mexico, Dr. Malay Batal from India, and dearest friend, Dr. Mustafa Suleiman from Egypt. Now, it's great to introduce my dear friend, Dr. Homan Jalei. He's a consultant to vascular and endovascular surgery and the director of European Venus Center University Hostel of Aachen and Maastricht. Uh, Dr. Jalei, in, uh, in the year 2012, had led the program of vascular surgery and intervention, which grew to become one of the most important program in the whole Europe. Dr. Jelly is the principal investigator of more than 60 articles, the most recent one involving the innovation of endovascular uh, revascularization and its outcome. Uh, he is uh, invited to many international centers and he uh, presented more than 100 lectures. Today, Dr. Jale is going to introduce a very nice topic, Venus stenting, how and the when, together with classification of CVO. Please, Dr. Jale, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Fakhri. Now my voice is there. Yes, very good. Thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction and thank you very much to Dr. Omar and Dr. Fakhri for inviting me to this webinar. Um, it's my honor to be here with my colleagues and friends from all over the world. So um, um, I am a consultant vascular and endovascular surgeon uh, working in University Hospital Aachen in Germany and University Hospital Maastricht in the Netherlands. And uh, today my topic is one is the how and when the right indication, the right diagnostic for the chronic venous obstruction and then the classification of the chronic venous obstruction. So I think we should start with the first presentation. Okay. So can you see my presentation? So you see a little bit of tips and tricks and uh, right diagnostic, right indication and decision making for the endovascular treatment of chronic venous obstruction. After it, we have time to discuss in detail this topic. This is my disclosure. So very important is what are the signs and symptoms of the chronic venous obstruction? And regarding the right decision-making and the indication, the patient needs to have really signs and symptoms of, uh, of this chronic venous obstruction. I had a young lady from Dusseldorf in my outpatient clinic who told me after eight kilometers of running, she had small itching in her, in her leg, left leg. And there was a slight compression of 
the um, uh, of the confluence of the cava, for me, this is not an indication to treat this patient and put a stent because after eight or nine kilometers of running, so she should reduce it one kilometer and just run maybe seven kilometers. So the patients really should have real signs and symptoms of the chronic venous obstruction or PTS, as you can see, swelling, tension, heaviness, pruritus, and collaterals as sign. And don't forget the venous claudication. If you have a deep venous center, you see really a lot of patients with venous claudication and they are impaired. Many of them are impaired due, this, due to this venous claudication in their daily life. So coming to the diagnostic, you see I divided it to, into preoperative, uh, perioperative, and post-op. Very important is the duplex sonogram in the pre-op session. So we need a profound duplex done or performed by a really good uh, duplexer or technician. We combine it in Aachen or Maastricht with an MR phlebogram as imaging. So in other centers, they use CT phlebogram. If patients had already venous stenting, then of course you have to go for CT. After having duplex MR and the anamnesis of the patient, you can then really decide or make your decision for treating or not. During the treatment, of course, you are using the ascending phlebogram. You need IVUS, very important, and therefore I made it red because this is one of the most important tools in the OR. And more and more we use after the procedure in the OR, the duplex, just to see how the, uh, the flow is in the groin after the treatment. So, but again, duplex is the most important tool in the preoperative setting. And during the operation, of course, ascending phlebogram, the angiogram is very important, using it in two plane or multiple plane, but with IVUS, not only you can precisely decide for the size of stent and your proximal and distal landing zone, and also you can reduce radiation exposure, and you can reduce contrast, the amount of contrast. And in a post-operative se setting, again, duplex is very easy. Even I can use a duplex in an easy way because you can visualize the stent, the length of the stent, the shape of the stent, measure area, diameter. Nearly you can do everything. If there are some further questions, then you can combine it with X-ray or CT phlebogram. So this is an example of duplex done by Irvin Tunder, our really brilliant duplexer and technician who works with us in Maastricht and Aachen. You see the groin, this is the left groin. You see the femoral vein as one main inflow vein. You see the deep femoral vein as the other main inflow vein. And you see the post-thrombotic trabeculation in both. And in this, this is not a dynamic uh, image, but you, uh, in this, in, in this uh, case, special case, it was a young lady, the inflow from the deep femoral vein was considered by us as enough. But of course, we can ask, what is enough? If, is 200 milliliter per minute enough with our machine, in our setting in Aachen? And uh, we know that with another machine, using by another technician, you ha may have another result. So there is no evidence, but uh, experience. So very important, precisely duplex sonography of the groin, of the inflow veins, of the collaterals, and of course, of the outflow, you can visualize it till the liver. So again, a patient, a young patient with so-called myterna, the compression in the confluence, or common iliac vein at the left side, I want just to stress the supine and upright position. In nearly every young lady who is thin, you can create with really small pressure, very small slight pressure, a myterna point. You can 
compress the vein just by putting the probe on the abdomen. So it is very important uh, that, that we prevent this, um, uh, this problem and perform a duplex in supine and upright position in order to say if there is a real myterna or not. And of course, I hope you can see the mouse here. You see the fibrosis of the vein. This is an important uh, point which creates after years of compression. And we combine it again with MRV. This is the MRV in axial plane of the same patient, young patient. You see the real severe compression. Again, an MRV or CTV is performed in supine position. So the upright position and Valsalva, duplex in Valsalva maneuver is very important. These are just images showing you how easily you can follow up the patient after two weeks, six weeks, three months, six months, and uh, yearly thereafter with duplex. You can visualize the stand very easily, the instant stenosis or thrombosis, the uh, covered or overstanted great saphenous vein, and even with stent, you can compress the stent easily and change the geometry. These are some examples of our venous maps, which I received from Irving Thunder, again, our duplex specialist or, or our technician. You see really visualizing the deep, the, the deep system and the superficial system. He visualizes us the chronic venous obstruction, the collaterals, the reflux, reflux is uh, drawn by, by with red, in red color. You see this is the reflux. So um, just consider this picture. This is an acute DVT due to a chronic venous obstruction in IVC. So these are really brilliant venous maps, which makes life easier and we can easier, uh, easily do our indication or make our indication. And of course, in combination with a good imaging, other imaging like uh, MRV or CTV. So I told you we measured the flow above the ostium or orifice of the deep femoral vein, for example, in this patient 200 milliliter. These are another examples, as you can see, uh, many patients with, with visualizing the inflow, the reflux in great saphenous vein, as you can see here, then the chronic venous obstruction, or in this patient, involvement of deep femoral vein and femoral vein and iliac tract. So very important, a profound diagnostic. Now coming to IVUS in two slides, just showing you how easily we can visualize the success with, uh, with IVUS. This is a, this young patient in whom you saw the duplex and MRV you see the very severely compressed proximal part of the iliac vein, common iliac vein left-sided. And then after stenting, you see it, the compression has gone. Again, I visualize it in the next uh, slide. You see the area was 31.5 square millimeter before stenting and after stenting showing in IVUS a good shape of stent, I tell it because Lowell is here, and a very good um, uh, shape of the stent, which is important. So after stenting, we have 166 uh, square millimeter. So now coming to some special points and maybe making a connection to the next presentation. Very important is the groin, is the inflow from deep femoral vein and femoral vein. And you see just showing you the differences between these patients, it is extremely important to know how is the involvement of common femoral vein. Is there any involvement? Is femoral vein involved, deep femoral vein involved, or just one of them? Because that affects the in indication, the, the decision making and our indication or even contraindication. 
So showing you just now very fast our classification, which is based on anatomical expansion of the post-thrombotic trabeculation, you see type one, two, three, five, and just these three groups should be considered as really extensive chronic venous obstruction. The group 4A, 4B, and 5, because group one is just a compression anywhere. Group two is the post-thrombotic disease, but not involving the common femoral vein. Group three, in this group, the common femoral vein is involved, but both inflow veins are patent. Really good chance to, to, to have a successful recanalization and patient uh, who is doing well after the procedure. But these groups should be really indicated uh, very rigid with a good and profound um, diagnostic. And the group five should be considered as contraindication. So what is the indication? Is a symptomatic obstruction in femoroiliac and cava level. Please, this is very important. After a DVT, if it is a proximal DVT and, and we, we uh, don't catch the patient in the first two or three weeks, and we cannot treat them in, in an interventional manner, then please use a conservative therapy and leave the patient for conservative therapy. Just see the patient, visit the patient after six months, but give the patient enough time to have the spontaneous recanalization. Maybe after 10 months, the patient doesn't need any stent. This is very important. Do not stent the patient after three months. And this is the contraindication. Just look at this phlebogram. There is no femoral vein and no deep femoral vein, just some collaterals and small veins. This is the group five of our patients. The severely impaired inflow should be considered as consideration in a normal daily life. Of course, in a uh, research setting, this is another topic. Like, like PTS access trial, but we are talking about the daily work. So DVT in the past 10 months, that means use a conservative therapy and see what is happening. Maybe the spontaneous recanalization is enough. And of course, asymptomatic patients shouldn't be treated. And contraindication from therapeutic anticoagulation. Just showing you a slide of endophlebectomy. In some patients, very rare cases, maybe we need endophlebectomy as a hybrid procedure. Of course, there is another technique. You see the group of the patients is 4A who might need endophlebectomy because you can remove the post thrombotic changes from the common femoral vein. And then we have a free inflow from a patent deep femoral vein. So this is the indication for endophlebectomy post thrombotic changes covering the orifice of deep femoral vein, but the deep femoral vein is patent. Another technique is, of course, doing, uh, putting a stent into the deep femoral vein. So this is a technique. If, if you want like, to do the um, uh, endophlebectomy, to perform the endophlebectomy, and you don't want to put a stent in the deep femoral vein, just puncture the mid femoral vein in the mid part of the upper leg, go into the trabeculation because we assume the femoral vein as in this slide is involved. So, but stay at the side of the deep femoral vein. This is the right leg. So we stay at the lateral side and then with the help of the vertebral catheter, we go into the deep femoral vein with the teruma wire just coming one millimeter back and then go up. Look, now going up. This is a technique which was mainly performed or many times performed by Richtergraf. So it's a very, very, um, I, I think, good technique in order to prevent endophlebectomy in patients with, for example, hostile groin or reduce. You do not want to go into these groins. So this is the technique and a good technique. So then, after recanalization in the right side, you can put everything away from the orifice of the deep femoral vein if you stand. Otherwise, you put everything into the deep femoral vein and you occlude your only inflow vein. 
So in my opinion, I have no evidence till now because we cannot compare studies together. I, we know that many, many colleagues have even good, very good results with Walston, like Marcia Lukli or Olivier Hartung. So, but in my opinion, we have new design dedicated Venus stand. If you want to stand, if the indication is there, then use dedicated Venus stand. And I don't want to make some advertisement for some special stand. I think in some, some positions, one is maybe superior to other, but these are all dedicated Venus stand with good radial force and good flexibility. Just give you an example. What happens if you just take some stand into the iliac tract? So as take home messages, my dear colleagues, a proper diagnostic approach is mandatory, mainly done because it's easy, it's cheap, by, and it's fast by duplex. Combining it with MRV and CTV of course, again, patient is on table, uh, in angio suite, on in OR, then of course you can use IVUS for precisely uh, making the choice for the landing zones or if you have to do the endophlebectomy or not. Do not overdiagnose my Turner syndrome. Nearly in every lady in a supine position, you can create a compression and then call it a my Turner. So this is not a my turner. You need more just than a compression, like looking with IVUS, looking for collaterals and duplex in prone and in, in upright position and valva, valsalva maneuver. The patient should have really signs and symptoms with impairment in his or her daily life. More strict indication, again, and respect the recanalization, even some some centers like Mark Garcia or Mert Duman Tepe, and in some small patients also we did it, uh, we can recanalize also femoral vein, but um, believe me, many of them are going to occlude again. So till now, there is no recommendation for the daily work. Use dedicated venous stands and in bigger size for the iliac tract, if you want to decide between 14 and 16, use the 16 because the, we know that these veins never reach 16. A 16 reaches, may reach maybe a diameter in the body of 14, and a 14 reaches 12. And many of them will have, after a few weeks, a thrombosis of the wall of the stand. So go for the bigger stand. And do not use short stand at my turn-up point. If you want to treat my turn-up point, in my opinion, the shorter stand you the shortest stand you want to use should be eight centimeter in order to prevent even one migration. Use IVUS, it makes life easier and makes the decision making easier. Stand from healthy to healthy, of course we know it. Adequate and aggressive anticoagulation, we start just one day before the procedure with our new oral anticoagulation and a rigid follow-up and very important is the two weeks follow-up because if a patient has a uh, early thrombosis in two weeks, after two weeks, you can catch the thrombosis and easily treat it and maybe treat the underlying disease or problem of the stand. But if the patient comes to you after four weeks and the thrombosis is three or four weeks old, it's too late. So just showing you a useless recanalization I don't know the, uh, the symptoms of the patient, but I just show you the treatment. This is the upper leg, but this is some few centimeters above the knee. We are looking at femoral vein. The colleagues used a really good dedicated venous stance, but just look, they stented from knee, one stent, two stents, three stents, four stents, five maybe yet now five and six and it was occluded after one day so probably after a few minutes or hours so there was no inflow and you kill all walls and you have from the lower leg there is no volume of blood so just give you an example or maybe we can call it a use full recanalization a patient mid-age with the chronic venous obstruction of the 
Kava on both iliac side, as you can see, and you see a filter in this area. The patient now was dealing three, four years with this problem. You see the filter here and the occlusion of Kava. We went integrate bilateral. We had to puncture the right jugular vein, go from retrograde. You see the, the wires from everywhere. Then we cross the, the main part then we made a um, dilatation, a simultaneous dilatation in order to crush the struts of the stent. That was after pre-dilation, after using dedicated venous stents, we used 14 millimeter because 14 has good radial force in this area. And going to next uh, slide, the last slide that was before reconalization, that was after reconalization. And this is the voice of the patient. It is in German, but maybe I know Lowell, so, Ayman, um, and Dr. Omar, you, you cannot understand it, but there are many Germans, and then I translate it just in few words. The patient is coming to me in an outpatient clinic after treatment, and I ask him. Please tell me, how are you doing now? So, um, thank you very much. I give just one translation. The, I ask the patient, please tell me, how, how are you doing? And I just uh, recorded the, the uh, Venus map done by Erwin Tunder, and he said, it is, I am like a new human being. Uh, better is not just explanation. I am totally new. I couldn't went uh, I, I, 200 meters. Now I am. I can do sport. I can. I have a new life. So and at the end he said, "You are my hero." Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very nice presentation. Thank you. It was a very nice presentation, Homan. I like it very much, especially the last ballerina uh, of the revascularization of the making a new IVC. This is perfect. Uh, now I have the honor to get some comments from our uh, great panel. Uh, it's chance to ask uh, Professor Lowell Kabnick from United States to ask or a comment or uh, Add what you would like to add, please, uh, Dr. Lowell. I have nothing to add. It was a brilliant lecture. Thank you, Umad. Thank I you. do have a question for you. Um, if a patient is a C3 patient with great saphenous reflux, ovarian vein reflux, and a Maytherner obstruction, which do you treat first and why? So the patient has C3. Swelling and varicose veins. Exactly. And the patient has the great Zephinus vein reflux and a pelvic ovarian, ovarian vein reflux and Obstruction, left iliac vein obstruction. <laughs> a difficult question, Lowell. So I, in my, in my very good question, thank you very much. Um, uh, in our regime, in uh, our center, in Aachen and Maastricht, we sure treat first the, it depends of course on the occlusion, but we go for treatment of the occlusion. If this C3 is really is the patient suffering from this C3? Is there really suffering? So, and of course, a little bit depending on the extension of the pathology, I am not going to, to for a C3, putting seven stents. But if it is a Myterna, as you told, who needs one stent, and the Myterna is a real Myterna, 
So um, evaluated very well, approached very well. Then we treat for sure with one dedicated venous stand, probably 16 millimeter to eight centimeter, the my Turner syndrome first, and then look in a uh, outpatient uh, setting what the patient is doing. And then, of course, you told me the ovarian vein is refluxive, but you know better than me, we should measure the diameter, see if there are pelvic varicosis or not, if this is only ovarian and ovarian reflux or with other problems. But the C3, then probably if the C3 remains going for the varicosis of the leg. Thank you. Thank Let you. me take on this point, Homan. Have you seen cases that when you correct obstruction of the deep system, you found that the reflux is actually self-cured? If you reassess after a couple of months, you found the great suffering vein reflux, ovarian reflux so might disappear. No, I never saw that a reflux of the uh, great saphenous vein um, uh, was, was non-refluxive. But I saw, of course, vanishing of all collaterals and flow from the deep femoral, from the deep femoral and femoral vein into the right, right highway with, in, the, in the femoroiliac tract with a refluxive great saphenous vein and with vanishing or improvement of many complaints in many cases, many cases. And these patients probably don't need any treatment of the varicosis vein. Of course, I saw, um, uh, on the other hand, I saw patients after treatment of the chronic venous obstruction, as Lowell mentioned, who needed treatment of varicose vein additionally. Okay. Yeah, this is a good point. I have to uh, reconsider. Uh, it is not only to abolish uh, or do recanalization, you have to over the varicose vein. This is a very good point. Uh, now I think uh, it's time to ask uh, Sergio, uh, what's your comment, Sergio, or, of, uh, or if you want to ask a question for... Uh... Sure, I, I will take the chance because having uh, one of the biggest experts in the world, uh, and again, congratulations, it has been a really nice uh, talk. So you briefly mentioned, Oman, uh, about... Uh, the your camera, Sergio. You briefly... Uh, your... Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah. So you, you briefly mentioned, Oman, uh, about the antithrombotic uh, attitude you have there with DOAX, but we know that it's really an open point in this moment uh, how to perform the anticoagulation and also the antiplatelets role. Can you dive a little bit more in this and guide us on how to behave? I, I think you brought it to the point. It's very, very uh, controversial. And, you know, um, Alun Davis did this uh, survey and, and there was nearly everybody is doing something else and maybe all of us are right but uh, we go for new oral anticoagulation as the main part of the anticoagulation therapy in in group one that means compression in group two three and even the severest the extensive disease for a for b and five with involvement of the influence the question is we we every time start before the procedure because uh, because we, um, re we we saw that after these big procedures after ending the procedure when patients is in the recovery room and going to the ward they have they have uh, really lost two three hours with anticoagulation so we start one day before with for example rivaroxaban but we do not use antithrombotic therapy very seldom but I cannot, I have no evidence to tell that other centers who are using anti-thrombotic uh, therapy, this is wrong. So for me, we need minimum of six months of anticoagulation in best cases, let us say my Turner syndrome, to have the stent endothelialized with, with the uh, cell of the patient in order to have the less thrombogenicity, which we could show in our animal study. I hope that will be soon published. And after six months, you have to see how the stent is, how the inflow is, how the outflow is, and then decide to stop it or go further for one year or even lifelong. 
That is very interesting. And if I can just add a second question to this, overtreatment is a big uh, issue in some countries, and you were mentioning IVUS in the periprocedural phase. So we know that it's very good uh, for the strategic planning of the procedure, but how is it important for you to decide if operating or not, the IVUS part? The IVUS? Mm. So I, I never use IVUS as alone. I use in nearly m many cases IVUS, but I every time consider the phlebogram, which I do in, in AP plane and in lateral plane, and see the collaterals. After treatment, I make another angiogram just in one plane, and then I use IVUS. With IVUS, I can see the total lumen, the, the shape of the lumen, my proximal landing zone, my distal landing zone. So I don't need another planes in order to reduce the radiation exposure. Uh, but every time it is never just one tool to say, okay, I was shows me now a compression. I was show, of course, shows the right compression. But I ask you, how many CTs did you see with many shapes of just one IVC. In the same patient, the IVC above the confluence is totally compressed with a bad aspect ratio and some few centimeters more proximal, you have the perfect, very big IVC. So you can, if you put IVC, you see, of course, this, this flattening or this um, compression or just a fall of the wall of the, of the uh, IVC. Uh, IVC. So, this is not alone an indication. Sure. But, and but, but IVUS, IVUS is very much more important for decision making where your landing zone should be, for, especially for the distal landing zone, seeing if in the front of the deep femoral vein you have some post thrombotic changes or not. Okay. Just one last quick, quick one about uh, people not speaking in German. Of course, we trust the report you made, but what would be an objective? Uh, measures of quality of life in these patients, up to your opinion? An objective quality of life measure. Of life like, yeah, yeah. Um, th this, is, this is very, very, very difficult for me. So we, we use the quality of, the, uh, of life is, is really um, uh, um, difficult because we have no evidence what is better and what is not better. Is, uh, SF36 uh, or, or other things. So, but very important is for me the Vilalta score. I know the shortcomings of Vilalta score. I know the shortcomings of VCSS and, and uh, other measurement tools and CAP classification. So, I think you have to make a really good anamnesis if you are doing a really research or on the research setting, then of course you need as much as possible of these uh, um, measuring tools. But very important, don't forget venous claudication is not, not considered in many of these uh, tools. Okay. Thank you so much. Let me go quickly. Do, do you have any comment, comment to Professor Mamoun al-Bashir? Do you like to add? I, I would, thank you very much, um, Omar, uh, Dr. Holman. That's a very good presentation. I just have a question. One of the most horrendous things that can happen to these patients is a stent occlusion. And when it happens suddenly, they seem to be getting, you know, getting worse results than they were before the stenting. So what's your protocol when that happens? And do you have a surveillance program for these stents? If, uh, therefore, I tell, uh, thank you very much. And um, nice to see you. Um, I uh, stressed or mentioned at the last slide the post-operative evaluation. Very important, very, very important is the two weeks post-operative evaluation. Because if you catch the patient or see the patient after two weeks and the patient is suffering from a DVT, many of them do not realize it because they had over years many collaterals. If the main highway is occluded now after one week, the highway, the, the collaterals are again open and they do not realize it. They have not a very big leg. So they come to you and you realize the, the, the reconalized tract is thrombosed. So in these two weeks, you can easily lyse the tract or do percutaneous mechanical thrombectomy 
like Aspirex, GDI, AngioJet, and, and other techniques. So this is the most important thing. See your patients okay. while you want to start them, and then after two weeks. The next thing is if you have a patient with chronic occlusion, you have a problem. There are techniques, of course, with the sharp back of the of the Terumo wire 0.18 or 0.35, or with uh, wires with with SI wires with higher tip load, you can re recanalize many of them. But you have to consider you cannot vanish or remove these old thrombus or the new uh, post thrombotic changes. You just can dilate it, and you every time lose lumen. So. These are patients who are doing not that well as before. Okay. Well, um, uh, my task is very difficult because uh, we have 21 questions and we have two uh, of the attendee raise their hand and we have 56 countries uh, looking into this webinar. So let me take the first question. Dr. Ahmed Ammar will open the voice for you to say the question yourself to Dr. Ahmed Ammar. Introduce yourself and ask the question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Dr. Amar from Mayo Hospital, Pakistan. I am Senior Registrar of General Surgery. Uh, it was a nice presentation from Dr. Roman, and, and I have learned valuable points from him. Uh, my question is that, uh, is there any uh, cutoff value of age in, uh, after which you cannot attempt these stenting and is there any comorbid conditions can affect this procedure because we have patients who are diabetic hypertensive chronic uh, hypertensive and and antiplatelets and multiple problems at the same time mm -hmm. so can we proceed with this stenting in these patients just thank you very much for the nice for this really nice question interesting question just to summarize, no, you can do the stenting nearly in every patient, but you know I am a friend of, to be honest, to be very rigid. So that means I'll give you an example. If a patient with a life expectancy of two months with a severe swollen leg due to acute thrombosis because of, because of tumor compression, you can really easily help this patient with just putting one stent in IVC or iliac tract, and you, the patient has a very, very improved quality of life in his next six months or one year. So that is a really difficult question to just be answered in one sentence or, or just saying this is our cutoff. Of course, if a 85 years old patient is coming to me and he says, I have a little bit swollen leg. I am not going to treat this patient. Or if a patient coming to me with acute proximal DVT, who I normally consider as for a treatment, and the patient is 80 years old, and he has a life expectancy of five to 10 years, why should I treat this leg in, in acute manner in order to prevent 40 to 50% of PTS in a patient in the next year. So that doesn't make any sense. So no, there is not a cutoff, but you should be, of course, rigid and do a mm, very good anamnesis and preoperative evaluation, as I told. But consider even sick patients or patients, multi-morbid patients for stenting if you think you can help them, because the stenting is easy and the complications rate is very, very low. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll take one final question before the second part of your lecture. And this uh, question comes from Turkey, from Professor Suat Dugansi. He said, excellent presentation. And he said, if you have a patient C5, um, when do you decide to operate on them rather than doing endovascular iliac vein recanalization? When, when is your cutoff point to operate? Operate means open surgery. Yes. Okay. When when I do open, I every time try endo in uh, the endovascular technique every time. And in our regime, if 
once I am I have no technical success, I would say three percent of patients, something like this, four percent of patients. Then we go for a second time in elective patients in elective chronic venous obstruction, and if after two attempts, so a few hours, I am not. It was not helpful, and the patient is suffering really from his PTS. Then we decide for a, a open surgery, which is very very seldom in the last four years, five years. Excellent. So we can go ahead to the second part of your, your presentation. We have now 300 attendees, and we have around 400 seeing the lecture live on Facebook. So uh, good luck. Thank you very much. So my next presentation is originally prepared for Sharing Cross 2020, and due to this condition situation, um, so unfortunately, we cannot go there. I am now sharing my desktop. So I would like to close the presentation. Yes. Hello everybody, my name is Kuman Jalai, I'm a vascular surgeon from Aachen and Maastricht. I thank the organizer of Sharing Cross to giving me the opportunity to present my topic online, which is new validated anatomic classification of chronic venous obstruction in iliofemoral tract and its clinical implications. This is my disclosure. I'm not trying to change the topic from venous to aortic, but just consider I would compare these two conditions with each other regarding the results after their treatment. Outcome after treatment of AAA versus outcome after treatment of thracoabdominal aortic aneurysm repair. Uh, that would be a senseless comparison, I think, even both are aortic aneurysms. In this slide, we see illustration of four different types of the extension of chronic venous obstruction. Now, my question is, can we compare the first image with the last image regarding their outcome after reconstruction and stenting? This is a table from a paper published 2011 by Olivia Hatum. It shows the results after stenting for chronic post-thrombotic occlusions of the iliac tract. Just notice the differences of primary and of secondary patency between these venous groups. I don't think that the reason of such a big discrepancy could be the skill of the surgeons or interventionalists or the type of the implanted stents. The reason is probably a big difference of the extension of the pathology in the patients included in these different studies. This table is from a recently published review performed by Williams and it shows the results of venous stenting using <clears throat> dedicated venous stents. Just have a look on the 12-month primary patency of patients with PTS as pathology. They range from 59 to 87%. The type of the stent cannot be the reason of the big discrepancy because Stephen Blake and Michael Lichtenberg both used VG venous stent. 
they both are very well experienced and therefore the technical aspect can be also ruled out as the reason of this discrepancy. So again, the reason probably is the extension of the pathology of the patients included in these different studies. The classification is based on the anatomical extension of the post-thrombotic changes and the importance of the inflow. It should be simple and practical Based on the available evidence, the additional involvement of IVC has a relatively low effect on decision-making. Therefore, a separate category for IVC has not been included. A 50% cross-sectional area reduction of the vein is considered as hemodynamically significant in this classification. As you can see, the group patients with compression of the vein. The treatment is very easy and the patency rates are very good. Group two are patients with chronic venous obstruction of iliac tract without any involvement of common femoral vein with a perfect inflow. Group three are patients with involvement of common femoral vein but only cranial, the ostium of deep femoral vein. This group of patients can be treated in an endovascular manner with a distal landing zone of stent just above the orifice of deep femoral vein. Group 4A post thrombotic tract ablation go more distally and involve femoral vein. Deep femoral vein is the main inflow vein. These patients need either stenting into the deep femoral vein or an hybrid approach with endophlebectomy of common femoral vein. Group 4B are patients with involvement of deep femoral vein and the femoral vein is the main inflow vein. These patients need either a hybrid approach or the extension of the stent into the femoral vein. Group five are patients with severely impaired inflow due to involvement of both femoral vein and deep femoral vein. These patients should mainly be considered as contraindication for any invasive treatment. In really selected cases with severe signs and symptoms of PTS, a recanalization of femoral vein additionally to iliac tract could be taken in consideration. The last three groups, 4A, 4B, and 5, should be considered as extensive chronic venous obstruction. These are preliminary data of the validation of this classification. Let us just have a closer look on the patency rates. They range from 60% in group 4A and B to 100% in group 1. This shows us the importance of the inflow. And here are the expert centers participating in validation of this classification. The classification of chronic venous obstruction help us to aid the scientific reporting, to ease our decision making regarding the indication and contraindication, support our trapoidic decisions, and to predict outcome easier. I thank on behalf of all participating centers, stay safe and healthy. Okay, very nice. Thank you very much. It is very nice indeed, it's very, and very nice and very conclusive. Although we all missed Sharon Cross, but now uh, you can get uh, the spirit of Sharon Cross. <laughs> Sharon Cross feeling. Yeah, <laughs> exactly.
I think uh, we can still uh, get uh, one or two questions before we do our polling. Uh, can you do questions, Dr. Omar, from the attendees? Okay, we have uh, three questions asked from the panelists. Uh, if we can open the voice for uh, Dr. Hisham Osman. Uh, Dr. Hisham Osman, uh, you can speak now, introduce yourself and ask your question. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Hisham. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can hear yes, you. Yes, you can. Thank you. Okay. Um, my question for Dr. Homan. Uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Hisham Osman. I'm a vascular surgeon from the state of Qatar. Uh, I'm sure you came across um, uh, young ladies uh, coming with uh, unilateral leg swelling and uh, you investigate them heavily, you don't find anything, and eventually uh, um, you come across uh, a maternal syndrome that's been confirmed, but the symptoms is only leg swelling. And these ladies are obviously, as you know, they're greatly bothered by the leg swelling. Uh, would you consider stenting on those ladies if you confirm this is definitely maternal syndrome. Would you consider something? And, and, and if, if you've done it in the past, would that improve the symptoms? Yes, um, I would consider this. Um, and uh, because you mentioned doing really a profound pro, uh, evaluation and uh, having the, everything just telling us this is a myterna in supine and upright position and talking to the patient, to be honest to the patient that, that we have no guarantee that the swelling uh, will be improved or the problems will be improved. If the patient is okay with that, yes, I would go for a standing. Okay, okay. so Thank we you. have four minutes left before the next lecture, Professor Mamoun. So let me take the question of Christina Mansour. We will open the voice for Christina to ask her question. Uh, yeah, hello. Hello. Hello, Christine. You want me to ask you a question, but uh, everything is clear to now. So basically, um, I'm just like focusing. I'm not surprised I think. And it's excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, but, uh, but now I don't have any question. But if I, I have a question, I will raise a I think there's a raise a here. Yeah. Ah, so, okay, sorry. I, I didn't realize that. Thank you. Okay. Do you have do you have a comment from uh, Professor Loyal Kapnik or Professor Mamoun Al Bashir in the uh, couple of minutes we have left? Yes, yeah, so I I do. I think the question that was just asked was a really germane question. In the United States with C3 disease, we've had a overwhelming um, increase in venous stenting. And a lot of those patients have not been helped. So as Human said, I think it's really important to make sure what you're dealing with is what the swelling is from. And really the last, last part of, of it would be a May Therner. So everything else needs to be ruled out before you go ahead and sent that patient because you'll have concomitant disease as well. And sometimes it's very difficult to tell, but make sure that that, then the question is, you've got a 30-year-old female and you're not sure, are you gonna stent that? Or if you have, I'm gonna ask Dr. Dr. Huan Jolly the question. You have a 30-year-old female with C3 disease, swelling, you've ruled out everything else, you're gonna stent her. What are your concerns about pregnancy? Thank you very much, Lowell. And thank you again for uh, making this um, nice but difficult que uh, questions. Um, uh, I would consider independent, not regarding any 
pregnancy, if the patient, I ask, because these are mostly young patients, I ask them if there is a plan in the next week or months or, or time, then of course we can wait. But if there is no consideration, no active planning, then I would go for a standing if in my opinion the indication is there, regardless the pregnancy. Because we have many patients now with stent who was pregnant and we also see them before uh, the time of pregnancy and after it and um, they are doing well. So really very seldom I saw compression of stent due to uh, birth of the child. So this is, or due to uh, the pregnancy. So um, nearly regardless to it, of course, again, I ask if there is a planning, then I would wait because this is not an acute condition which this patient is suffering from, maybe three years, five years, 10 years or two years. So then we can wait another one year. But if not, then I would do the stent. I have one so technical question. Oh, okay. Lowell. Thank you. The technical question has to do with a chronic uh, venous obstruction or thrombotic lesion. When you um, are approaching that and you're using your high pressure balloon for pre dilatation, do you go to nominal or do you go to burst pressure? And what do you do post operatively? I mean, post uh, stem. Yeah. We, we use every time the Atlas balloon. Uh, it means we go up to 14, 15, or 16. And um, every time we use the same size of the balloon as we want to stand. So let us say 12 in femoral vein, 14 in femoral vein to external iliac, and 14 to 16 to the common, and IVC much bigger. And then we stand, and again, we use the same balloon and post dilate the stent to the nominal diameter. But I told you, we published um, um, a study in a phlebology two years ago. No, not even one of these stents reaches the size of this nominal size it is given on the package. So it doesn't mean that the st these stents are bad. No, but the, 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 the tissue around it doesn't allow that the stand, which could be 16 millimeter, reaches 16 millimeters. So a 16 is probably 14, 40.2 or 40.3, and the 12 is less. So therefore, we go for a bigger stand. That's very nice technical tip. So let me give the mic to Professor Ayman to introduce the next presenter. Professor Ayman. Uh, no, uh, before we do that, I would like to thank uh, Homan. It is a great lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank all uh, the group because we have now more than 500 uh, all over the world uh, in uh, more than 60 countries joining us. Uh, it's great. I think it is a very uh, successful event. Thank you all. Uh, before we ask uh, Dr. Mahmoud, I will ask Dr. Oman to make the bowling, the first bowling. Are you ready, Oman? Yes, I am ready. Uh, if we can put the first polling on the screen. Yes, I will read the polling and each of the NCD can select one of the three options. In patients with successful iliac vein stenting after iliac vein occlusion, how important would you rate the post-operative use of graduated compression stocking? A, very important. B, medium important, or C, not important at all? We have 30 seconds to answer this question. You select your answer and submit, and we'll show it uh, live. It's a very democratic system. It doesn't uh, allow for any errors or hacking, so you will get an, an honest assessment uh, out of the 600 or more plus attendee. So we are like in very big room in Charing Cross, full of candidates. Can we see the results? <clears throat> okay. Great. Okay. So 73% say very important, 
21% medium and only 6% not important at all. Okay, so up to you, Dr. Ayman. Thank you. Now I am honored to introduce my dear friend, Professor Mahmoud Sharif. Uh, Mahmoud Al Bashir is a consultant of uh, vascular and endovascular surgery and uh, consultant of organ transplantation. Uh, he is a fellow of Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh and uh, Ireland. Uh, he uh, has the Jordan Board of General Surgery and Vascular Surgery. Uh, Ma'moon is a fellow of International College of Angiology and American College of Transplantation. He is, he is the director of an Institute of, of Ultrasound Education and uh, CME director of uh, International Health Academy and CEO of uh, Vena Care, Venus and Wound Care Center, a man, uh, Jordan. Uh, Professor Mahmoun is going to discuss a very nice topic. He's going to tell us about uh, onco, vascular oncosurgery. Please, Dr. Mahmoun, the mic is yours. Thank, thank you, Ayman. Thank you for the kind um, introduction and for the kind invite to be part of this uh, very successful um, sort of online training program. Let me just, uh, if I may find my presentation, which is... And congratulations on shaving, Professor Mahmoud. Oh, thank you. I, I was worried I'm going to scare a lot of people off, so that's why I thought I'll, <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do this. Let's... Um, so you go with the share screen button, is that right? Uh, which is... You go in the share screen, which is the green bottom at the end. Sure. And um, you would have been open your PowerPoint ready yeah. and share the screen of the PowerPoint. It gives you multiple options. All right, let me just... So share screen yes. and select the window for PowerPoint. All right, and... And welcome, Raul. You must have been very busy in India doing uh, endovenous laser. Screen. Yeah, uh, you press on the. Green all right, button. that's it. Here we are. That's it. Yes, we are. Okay. I'm, I'm a, one, of, one of the generation. Uh, I don't know what you call what, they, what you call it, but the generation which is in the middle, so the fifties, the, the fifty-year-old generation, were technically a bit um, on the You're go. Very young, Mamoun. You're very young. <laughs> well, thank you very much, my dear friend. Yes. So vascular onco surgery. This is a very um, surgical topic, to be honest. We're going to move uh, from the interventional arena to the extremely surgical. Um, arena uh, and it's um, so just let me get down I'm going to advance these slides all right so what is uh, vascular oncosurgery a surgery of tumors of or closely involving vascular structures and this is what makes vascular surgery such a unique spectrum because vascular surgery involves all areas of the body and it has great interest for multiple specialties as well. Um, that's why when you get a pathology that affects these major parts of the anatomy uh, in different um, either compressive or uh, invasion uh, ways, then it's a great interest for the vascular surgeons to be involved with this. Vascular oncosurgery is almost becoming a separate specialty. Where, as you will all you are all well aware, uh, there are so many interests in vascular surgery, and people are trying, um, especially in specialized centers, to get the uh, volume of cases that they can develop a great interest in this. Um, the English say, if you want to uh, get something done, give it to a busy man. So, uh, when vascular surgeons get really busy, they find a new area of uh, of interest. Um, this is an apple. This is to quote the CNN um, uh, ad uh, targeting uh, the president, uh, which emphasizes the facts. So we should be, we sh should always stay online with the facts. And I bring this up because we need to emphasize the role of surgery in cancer care. Surgery provides zero order kinetics of tumor removal. I'm a great believer in surgery in um, onco uh, therapy, um, mainly because you know, with the exception of few um, hematological malignancies, 
uh, the only modality which probably gives the patient uh, cure or the potential of cure is probably surgery. There are great advancements in this arena. However, surgery is still the mainstay. Even with tumors that you can shrink down right to smaller sizes, you're not winning unless you remove the tumor. Its contribution to cancer, to cancer treatment in concert with other modalities is evident, and advances in the treatment of cancer will derive from improved orchestration with these modalities rather than improved operative techniques alone to um, quote the great Bernard Fisher. So what, what, what sort of areas are we talking about? Well, there is a, a small entity first we'll touch on, and it's called vascular tumors. Vascular tumors would include hidden neck barrier gangliomas, neoplasias of the vessels, which has a, you know, a, a tremendous uh, multiple classifications. This is one of the simplest ones. Uh, and vascular lesions mimicking tumors. Out of this subset of vascular tumors, we're going to talk about the hidden neck barrier gangliomas in specific, because we're talking about solid, solid tumors that are a challenge uh, for uh, the uh, oncosurgeon or the vascular um, oncosurgeon. The rest of the, um, the slide are uh, areas of interest. However, they do not come under the umbrella of vascular oncosurgery. Uh, the head and neck barogangliomas are quite interesting uh, pathologies or tumors, um, and they do have a, you know, multiple classifications, but the one I find most useful is the one which classifies them uh, in relation to, to uh, their uh, location. So more than 80% are located in the head and neck. Um, they make up about 0.5% of all head and neck tumors. And paragangliomas are rare neoplasms that are derived from epithelioid cells migrating from the neural cleft in close relation with autonomic ganglion um, cells. Uh, they're named after uh, the site of uh, origin, but the two main groups are the cervical ones and the skull base ones. The carotid and vagal ones, cervical ones, are probably the ones that vascular surgeons will come across um, mainly, and those are the ones that we, we, we will be discussing um, in this um, presentation. Just to give you a brief historical background, uh, th this is a pathology which has been um, around for a long time. I have special interest in uh, medical history, and I've, I, I, in my old days in, in London, I used to go to this um, uh, old um, antiques market where you collect uh, books, old books, and I found a surgical book, 1886, which uh, discusses in part of it the uh, paragangliomas. It does talk about uh, Meidel removing the CBP uh, successfully, um, and it, it emphasizes how difficult and deadly therapy is. The unfortunate thing with all these textbooks is the mortality was 100%. It wasn't until 1903 that uh, Shoda removed the uh, first uh, carotid body tumor with the preservation of the carotid body and no um, nerve injury. Um, I'm going to discuss this through our own data. So we, we, we've, we've been sort of uh, fortunate or maybe unfortunate to see a lot of these tumors in the past 20 years. We've seen um, 66 tumors in 61 patients uh, with a lesion history dating back six months to 30 years prior to seeding them. And this, is, and this is in Jordan, our center in Jordan. Um, and th there's a reason for this, because a lot of surgeons during their career wouldn't see that big a number of carotid body tumors or paragangliomas. And the reason is we two folds. One, some of these cases were sort of lingering around not being um, treated uh, surgically for a long time, mainly because of, you know, the absence of specialized units or expertise to treat, to deal with them. And that's why we found some cases of dating back to up to 30 years, um, we, you know, with diagnosed but not treated. And the other one, we tend to be a sort of a, a country of uh, massive medical tourism, and we get a lot of patients from adjacent countries, and one of these countries is Yemen, and Yemen is, has very high altitude, where they have a huge incidence of um, carotid body tumors. In fact, uh, one of uh, our friends, their uh, surgeons, uh, have a massive uh, series of these. They're more like, more like a, 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 a para um, neoplastic, like a hyperplasia syndrome rather than a true neoplastic syndrome, but the, in, the, the eventual result is the same. They do get the tumor and they need to be um, treated. Some of these will be initially misdiagnosed as other things. Uh, in our series, 12 were, uh, 
and 10 were discovered after we started our duplex surveillance program. The diagnosis is usually suspected clinically and confirmed by um, duplex. Um, it's further confirmed and you get the absolute anatomy with it with a CTA MRA. In the old days, it used to be angiography as a first line, but now we, all patients will get a CT angiography or MRA. Uh, and that will not only give you the, the uh, anatomical detail and the invasion areas and the soft tissue um, extension, but it, it gives you also the relations to the uh, vasculature and uh, subsequent surgical therapy uh, plan. And geography has a massive role. It does have a characteristic vascular blush um, it also shows the uh, goblet deformity, what's called the goblet deformity, which is anterior displacement and splaying of the bifurcation. It confirms the diagnosis. In addition, it shows you blood supply. It can show you bilaterality when you uh, image both sides. But its main focus has been with the advent of preoperative embolization for these um, uh, tumors. Uh, and that's, um, you know, a, an area of interest for many, especially people who work with these tumors. Um, for a certain period of time, we were very keen to embolize a lot of these patients. We did actually use embolization, preoperative embolization in 11 cases. However, we, uh, we sort of uh, uh, abandoned preoperative embolization for two reasons. One, because of the complications. Um, ischemic renal nerve we had it in one, occlusion of the external carotid in two, access problems in one. Um, and the other one was, it did not give us the advantage that it's supposed to be. Uh, the advantage was uh, reducing uh, surgical bleeding. In fact, with the current surgical techniques uh, and the modifications and you know, the uh, experience, uh, once you take off from the learning curve, um, the blood loss is not um, that big an issue. And it also had a, a minor disadvantage uh, where uh, it's when done sort of, you usually do it 48 hours before, it just makes a dissection that that's a little bit more uh, difficult. The surgery itself, we operated on 64 tumors in 59 patients. Five patients had more than one tumor, bilaterality or uh, multicentricity. Uh, the surgical approach was similar in all patients. Uh, we had to sacrifice the external carotid artery in about 14 uh, cases. Uh, we had an uh, unfortunate episode of ligating one internal carotid uh, as a last result in one case, uh, which was a lady who was very lucky that he, she did not um, sustain any neurological deficit, even with that. Uh, we had um, ICA interposition graphs uh, in three uh, cases. The reason for us having these um, higher, slightly higher rates of um, ECA uh, sacrifice and sort of interposition graph because we operate on Champlin two and three mainly. In fact, we, we, none of these cases was a Champlin um, one. Well, the surgery, you probably many of you are familiar with this. This sort of includes the usual uh, positioning, exposure. Um, we uh, are very careful to dissect everything, especially the distal controls of the ICA, uh, before we uh, start uh, removing the tumor. Um, with the advent of bipolar and uh, ligatures, uh, the dissection is uh, slightly easier. Um, I myself like using unipolar, to be honest, and I sort of, you know, you get to a degree where you're doing this. Um, uh, pretty fast, so you, you wouldn't, um, with, with very limited blood loss, so it, it's not that risky of a procedure. And once you get an entry into the, the periadventitial plane for the tumor, um, uh, or the white line of the tumor, then um, you're almost uh, home and dry. Um, it, it's, it's, you haven't done it until you, you've done it and you've done a few of those, you struggle with the first few ones and then uh, you know, there's a way that you, you find your way about uh, doing the distal dissections, proximal controls and proceeding with the um, uh, surgery. Once you remove the you know, hemostasis is essential and preservation of the um, uh, vessels. We, um, in some cases, um, we do um, check with the duplex scan if we're worried about the ICAs or the control uh, of the completion uh, result, but in most, um, is the clinical uh, picture at the end of surgery um, is enough. 
which brings us to the Champlain classification, which is an intraoperative classification. It classifies the tumors according to their adhesion or um, invasion into the uh, vessels. So Champlain 1 is localized tumor, um, Champlain 2 uh, adherent tumors, Champlain 3 intimately surrounding uh, the vessels. In fact, 3 now has a 3B, where it's a proximal bifurcation um, a tumor uh, behaving like a very aggressive tumor without involving the um, nerves, uh, the cranial nerves themselves. Um, about 67% of our um, patients were uh, Champlain 3, which explains some of the higher rates of uh, vascular uh, procedures, including the ICA's interposition grafts. There are a few maneuvers interoperatively that you can use to um, uh, ease the access for the distal ICA, including, um, you know, uh, uh, dislocation or um, mandibular transection, um, obviously nasal uh, intubation, styloid uh, re process removal. All these we've used one way or another in some of these uh, cases. Most cases you probably wouldn't need to use any of them. So results, we had one major stroke leading to in-hospital uh, death. This was an unfortunate case where, to be honest, we, um, uh, did, she, she had a, a malignant tumor, which was post-operatively found to be so. And malignant tumors uh, are prothrombotic. Um, they're difficult to diagnose preoperatively. Uh, you only can, um, you know, almost do that with the extensive uh, post um, uh, mortem um, histological studies, um, et cetera. Um, we had one late death, which was also a malignant tumor. So both mortalities were related to malignancy. So a minor strokes, completely recovered. Um, thin cranial nerve injuries, most of these are temporary. Eight had complete recovery, and two of them had partial recovery. Uh, we had one incomplete tumor resection, and that was a massive, massive tumor that we thought, um, you know, it endangers patient, the patient's life to continue with it. A uh, very elderly uh, lady, uh, two malignant tumors mentioned above, and two endocrine active um, tumors. Brings us to the familiar cases because of the bilaterality and multicentricity. So, um, we had two families and we started noticing these familial cases uh, and doing our surveillance program based on these familial cases where we, you know, if we get one case, you know, we ask them about the rest of the family and in the Middle East, they tend to have large uh, families and we did find uh, a couple of families that um, have, um, uh, one family had uh, three uh, sisters uh, with a familial form uh, and another large family of 11. On surveillance, we had three siblings uh, with tumors. Um, one had resection of both tumors, three had resection of three tumors, and the rest declined uh, treatment, mainly because of the stigma that is socially attached to the family when they get, you know, all treated. Um, recent um, genetic studies have shown that there is, uh, you know, a gene responsible for uh, these uh, cases uh, with the Crip cycle uh, metabolism, uh, and mitochondrial um, uh, genetics, uh, and it seems to be the explanation why do they get uh, the familial um, cases. Multicentricity and bilaterality uh, is observed in our series in four patients. Uh, one was a 31-year-old female who presented with a left-sided carotid body tumor and a synchronous retro cable. We've done all tumor removal. So we do it in stage manner. We do the carotid body first, and then subsequently we do the abdominal surgery. Um, another had the glomus vigali and a carotid on the same side, and uh, four patients had bilateral um, uh, tumors. This is, is probably um, concludes my uh, first um, part of vascular oncosurgery uh, with emphasis on uh, the uh, paragangliomas and the carotid body tumors. And it brings us into um, the second one, which is probably more interest, of interest to many um, surgeons, because this is a multidisciplinary, multi-specialty um, therapy. And you only can develop, you can only develop uh, this sort of practice if you develop the, your uh, relationships with the other surgeons. And it's usually a referral service where other surgeons will ask you if you can you know, help them with this to start with, and suddenly you're getting the cases because you start being known for them. It's a multidisciplinary thing because you need the general surgeons, the orthopedic surgeons, the plastic surgeons, the oncosurgeons, all these specialties. And we've done cases with all, all these uh, specialties. I'll start with the 
uh, first group, which is the mediastinal tumors. Uh, this is one of our cases, uh, a lady who came in with a benign uh, mediastinal tumor, nine-year history that is uh, completely obstructing the SVC. Uh, and uh, she had, she had uh, in her home country um, uh, an attempted removal, which ended up with a bit of bleeding. They closed up and, and stopped the surgery. Uh, when she came to us, she, she, had, she was very symptomatic with SVC syndrome, which is a horrible disease to have because these patients, you know, they sneeze and they suddenly, um, you know, dizzy or faint or they laugh and they're faint, very swollen face. Um, and we proceeded to do um, her surgery. It was a, a, an auricular internal jugular bypass using uh, a deep femoral uh, vein is a very nice surgery to do. It, it does need a lot of preparation pre-hand uh, because you need to scan all the vessels to know what's patent, what isn't. Uh, on this lady, the left internal jugular was the only vessel which was uh, patent. Um, Post-operatively about a month subsequently, the features for her face returned back. She, uh, you know, her symptoms greatly involved improved and it's a, it's a life-changing experience for a lot of these uh, patients. Removal of the, removal of the tumor is, um, itself, um, you know, especially with the um, uh, thoracotomy, it's, it's a major undertaking and it takes time because you, you've, you've done the removal, then you have to do the bypass. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's something you do for, um, you know, young people who tolerate the surgery and who have the uh, uh, SVC uh, syndrome. Um, interventional part of this is non-existent because this is a compressive lesion so you cannot um, you know do anything if you do not remove the compressive uh, lesions um, I don't know I managed to stop here or continue with the um, we, can, we can take a few questions yes uh, professor Ayman if you open the mic okay thank you very much Mamoun this is very well, interesting and it is uh, very nice to stop for a few minutes to get some questions. Um, uh, this is a very interesting topic, and this uh, showed us uh, how it is important for multidisciplinarity in our hospitals, and uh, I like your dissection very much. You are making a very neat surgery, in fact. Um, I would like to ask uh, the panel, uh, 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 let's start by uh, Dr. Uh, Sergio. Uh, do you have uh, a comment for uh, Mamoun? Uh, Sergio is not with us. We have uh, Loyal Kabnik and we have Raul. And I have uh, two questions from attendees. So whatever you want, of course, I know. Uh, if we don't have a question from uh, uh, Professor uh, Kabnik, uh, okay. uh, let's go for I don't that. have any questions. I'm learning. <laughs> okay. Thank so, you. Okay. Uh, in this? Of the attendee, we have two questions. Professor Ayman, I will take them. The first question from uh, Yuniz Baran. Yuniz Baran will open your mic and you can ask, introduce yourself and ask the question. Yuniz Baran. Welcome, Yuniz. It it seems we we lost his connection. We can take the other the other uh, attendee, which is Ghazi Al Nabolsi. We open you, Professor Ghazi Al Nabolsi. You can ask your question. Uh, good afternoon. I want to thank uh, all of you and Dr. Mamoun. Actually, I have two questions for Dr. Mamoun. Uh, first of them, about carotid body tumors. Do you check for uh, metastasis before you start the surgery? Uh, second question for you, for visual tumors. What's the indication for resection? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ed. I, I did not get the second one for which tumors? For vagal tumors. Oh, vag vagal tumors, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so um, we, we, thank you very much for uh, the nice question, uh, Dr. Ghazi. Uh, the, regarding the uh, first one, malignancy with the carotid body tumor, as you know, uh, you know, 
carotid body tumors or paraganglion tumors are mainly uh, benign. They can turn malignant. Some literature calls the number 10%, it's probably less than that, uh, somewhere between five and 10%. Uh, however, malignancy, to diagnose malignancy have been difficult in the, in the past because you can only do it through invasion into the lymph nodes or the behavior of malignancy. They do not usually metastasize until very uh, late. They do um, compress adjacent uh, structures and they can even uh, grow very fast suddenly to compress even the trachea. Uh, so they cause more symptoms than the usual painless uh, pathology of the benign um, tumor. Uh, isotope scanning and PET scanning recently has been very helpful because it can give you an indication of uh, the malignancy uh, potential, histological invasion into a, a adjacent uh, lymph nodes, and that's why you always have to take the lymph nodes if, they, if you see them intraoperatively to be um, enlarged. The malignant tumors, unfortunately, tend to have very bad results. Um, because um, you know there isn't much therapy for them. Even radiation therapy, which is used as a palliative technique in some cases, is not um, that uh, effective. Uh, regarding vagal tumors, we out of our series, uh, I, I, I probably didn't go uh, into much detail of that. We had eight glomus vagalis, uh, and they're very um, interesting tumors to operate upon. Uh, in many of them, you have to go distally with a dissection to get the control. And in some of them, you can lose the, um, the uh, vagus in part or uh, total. The problematic ones is when you get bilateral glomus vigali, and that, that's uh, quite um, uh, a problem because the, the potential for complications uh, is even uh, higher. Uh, we uh, tried in our cases, in, in most of them, to preserve uh, the uh, vagus um, successfully with some uh, compromised, temporary compromised uh, function, uh, but in two cases we couldn't. So, um, you know, they, they, they tend to be a bit more difficult. And if they're very high, uh, it's not a bad idea to get a neurosurgeon on board um, just in case you get to go um, higher to the base of the skull. Uh, again, thank you, Mamoun. Uh, we have increasing the attendees. Now we have more than 600 all over all platforms, either uh, through Zoom or Sigvaris uh, page, Facebook Sigvaris page. Thank you all. Please, can you keep on, Dr. Mamun? Sure. So we'll, we'll uh, I'll resume uh, the share. Which brings us to the second group of these interest. You know, these interesting. Um, tumors or malignancy that invade into major, major vessels, and that's the germinal retroperitoneal tumors. Most of these tumors are metastatic from gonadal tumors. They usually uh, present late due to organ compression and vascular involvement. They include the seminomas, teromatomas, and embryonic carcinomas. Um, One of the first cases that got me interested into vascular oncosurgery is, is, is this case. This is one of our cases. It's a young man, a university student, who came in with a sort of a, a billy which looked like a nine-month pregnant lady. He had a massive uh, retroperitoneal germinal tumor. He had um, uh, a seminoma operated uh, a couple of years earlier, and he was refused surgery because, as you can see, most of the major vessels are involved uh, in this uh, tumor, including the SMA and the cilia. Um, his um, symptoms were bad enough that he's sort of vomiting all the time and he's sort of withering away. He was a big man and sort of reduced um, in, in weight. Uh, so we, uh, you know, we, we, it was, it was a, a, to start with, to be honest, wasn't sure how curative we're gonna be, but I, I was definitely keen to reduce his, his uh, symptoms. Uh, so we went in with a sort of a Mercedes type uh, incision uh, and we couldn't get the tumor in whole following the dissection of the major vessels. We did get it in two portions, however, uh, and he done very well with it. He had a minor recurrence uh, three years on, which was also uh, removed and he's done very well um, indeed. And that's the good thing about these tumors. They're, they're uh, anatomical, they're compressive, uh, you know, they, they, they need, you know, the aggressive effort to remove them. But once you do, you're, um, you, you've done the, the patient a great uh, service. 
I do not believe any patient should be refused surgery for the complexity of, of the surgery or the risk of it because they have no other option. Retroperitoneal tumors, primary retroperitoneal tumors, especially sarcomas, are another group which falls into that uh, category. Although they represent 03 to 0.8% of all neoplasias, uh, and they're mostly uh, mesenchymal in origin, they do happen in a younger age group. They tend to, be, to present very late, and when they do present, um, you know, they, they're causing um, a lot of problems. They are a critical subset of tumors because uh, you need to get the whole tumor with the invaded uh, viscera or organs without uh, rupture of the tumor intra-abdominally, otherwise it will uh, seed and metastasize. And I'll take you through a couple of those. This is one of the cases uh, we had a few years ago where it was compressing uh, the aorta, the renal vessels, the kidney on one, one uh, side, um, and it, although it was an incidental finding, but the uh, size of the tumor was, was quite um, advanced. Uh, this is another view of the tumor, and you can see how the whole side of the uh, aort, the aorta is pushed to one side and it's invaded on whole uh, one side. When they invade vessels or um, invade uh, organs, viscera, you should not attempt to dissect them off. You, they should be removed with the invaded vessel or, or uh, viscera, and that, because that gives the patient the best chance of cure. One of the questions I get asked frequently, what do you do about confirmation of the uh, pathology, histology? Do you, you know, um, um, take uh, histology beforehand or, or not? A lot of these patients come to me being diagnosed histologically, so histology is already made. However, if I see these and, and, and they fulfill the radiological criteria, um, and I'm convinced that this is a, a retroperitoneal sarcoma because of the features for the patient, the radiology and the clinical uh, features, I, I do intraoperative um, uh, removal and I do not uh, give, you know, take the risk of disseminating the tumor through preoperative uh, histology. This uh, tumor was removed, um, you know, in whole with the uh, aorta segment that was invaded as part of the tumor as well, part of the colon and the uh, one kidney, and the aorta was uh, totally uh, replaced. We also covered the aorta usually in these patients when you replace it. Uh, the, I use the PTFE and uh, cover it with the uh, visceral uh, peritoneum for protection and reducing the uh, risk of subsequent infection. Some of these cases, it will be the IPC, and I'll do exactly the same with the IPC uh, replacement. Brings us to a next group, which is the liver tumors. I, I happen to be a liver transplant surgeon. I have a special interest in uh, liver malignancies. Um, and liver tumors are quite, um, you know, interesting because um, if you do not have the option for um, uh, liver transplant, like which for liver tumors, mainly SEC, which fulfills the criteria uh, and the child classification of the patient is, is adequate, uh, then you have uh, uh, an option for uh, resection. And uh, resection of these tumors, um, you know, especially when they're very large, is quite uh, demanding, uh, and you have to worry about the residual uh, liver function as well. In this case, most of the uh, uh, low uh, the liver was uh, taken by the lesion, and we, we, we do a pre-maneuver of embolization of the affected uh, part of the portal vein so that the other uh, part of the liver, the normal liver, will hypertrophy, and then we can do uh, the resection, and that's what we've done in this case, and you can see the embolizing material everywhere in the uh, embolized uh, part, so we can preserve part of the uh, liver. The right lobe of the liver is all uh, embolized, the left lobe is uh, hypertrophied enough to give liver function post uh, resection. Um, and once you resect, in this case, we needed to reconstruct the portal vein, reconstruct the cava using uh, the gonadal uh, vein, but the patient has done very well. And because they're normal livers and young, relatively young, um, uh, you know, um, uh, they do very well. This is a fibrolar Miller type uh, of tumor histologically. 
Uh, this is another one where, where also you do a resection and reconstruction of the portal vein. Most of the time, you have enough space um, to uh, re-anastomose the portal vein as it is. Uh, in a recent case, we had a, a couple of months ago where the uh, portal vein was also invaded. We had to replace it. I, use, I usually use the internal jugular vein to replace, it, to replace the portal because it's a, it's a big enough uh, vein with no valves uh, usually and does the job nicely. Renal tumors, these are probably the most common tumors that uh, you know, vascular surgeons will probably uh, get referred and uh, face, which are renal tumors invading the um, uh, cava. Uh, and they usually sort of uh, referred because the potential for cure when you remove the tumor and um, the invasion is very good for these patients without um, surgical, adequate surgical removal. Uh, they do not have much of a chance. Uh, so renal tumors in general, they're benign or malignant, adenomas, uh, oncocytomas, uh, angiomyelibomas, fibromas. But the most important one is the renal cell carcino carcinoma in the adult uh, population uh, specifically. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, basic uh, pathogenesis of these is well recognized to um, uh, many uh, if usually they happen in the fifth decade, uh, most of these patients are usually um, healthy, uh, young, and if uh, uh, you, know, you give them good surgery, you remove the tumor, they do have uh, much uh, better uh, prognosis. Uh, the only requirement I always ask is, none, is the absence of metastasis. So if there are myths anywhere, uh, you, you know, we, we, we do not operate. But if, regardless of the invasion, even if it reaches the, the atrium, and we've done that, uh, it doesn't matter as long as there is no uh, metastasis. This is one such case where there's a very, very large uh, renal tumor, RCC, uh, and invading the cava intrahepatic, and it's going um, you know, all the way to the um, uh, diaphragm. Um, the, 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 this, this type of surgery needs a, a total hepatic rotation, so you can control the cava in whole, and you can expose the hepatic veins um, as well. Um, it's, it's quite um, demanding. Uh, I usually do a lower median sternotomy as well, and I like controlling the um, supradiaphragmatic uh, IVC uh, to prevent embolization, and that would be very temporary uh, control. Uh, I always warn my anesthetist before I do that uh, vital step, because once you have the control of the uh, cava distally, the supradiaphragmatic cava, the tumor is sort of dissected out, the liver is rotated, you're ready to, to clamp the cava, the uh, venous return will drop and the pressure will drop, and that's why the anesthetist should be on board. There are the special maneuvers uh, we give them. Uh, speed is, is vital with these surgeries, uh, so that as soon as you remove the tumor and the uh, thrombus, the tumor thrombus or the invasion from um, inside the cava, you need to restore uh, uh, blood flow. And the supra uh, diaphragmatic IVC control, I found extremely helpful in preventing embolization uh, to the heart because these can easily embolize and they get you into trouble with the patient, uh, obviously systemic. Uh, condition. That's we've done, what we've done uh, in this case, and you can see that um, the tumor is uh, removed with the thrombus invading all the way uh, to the diaphragm. Similar tumors happen in pediatric age group, pediatric malignancies, the Wilms tumors. There are two, two kinds, main kinds, the Wilms tumors and the neuroplastomas. The Wilms tumors, they usually lipulated tumor masses, encapsulated. Um, they have a mixture of immature cells uh, in histology. Um, the good thing about these tumors is, is the massive impact uh, you will have on the child's life when you do the procedure, which is a combined chemotherapy and surgery. And you give the chemotherapy before to reduce this, try to shrink the tumor as much as you can. The five year, year survival will be about 90%. Percent and the younger the child, the better uh, to do the surgery. You know they do have get uh, they do get better results when they're less than two years um, old. A similar tumor is also the neuroplastoma. This is one of these um, tumors. Uh, I used you know I also use the median sternotomy and 
the Mercedes um, type incision for these for maximal exposure. You cannot compromise exposure on, in these patients. You have to be very comfy uh, with uh, your procedure. Liver mobilization is uh, complete. Uh, so that you, once you get the tumor, and this was invading um, all the way um, to the diaphragm as well, uh, then you can, they usually have a very fibrotic type invasion uh, into the cava, but you can get it um, uh, off the cava. If it's very adherent, it's, ID, it's better to excise part of the cava, and if it's less than 50%, um, you uh, can patch it or uh, replace it. Another group is the adrenal and extra-adrenal tumors. The, these are usually very difficult because of their location. Um, this is one of these tumors where it was located right at the confluence of the renal artery, the, the, um, the, the uh, or, you know, aortic um, uh, renal artery bifurcation or, or branching, and the renal vein um, um, butting into it, and if you do the adequate dissections, um, you can get these with preservation of all vital um, structures. It's important um, to establish there are no myths with these because they can go into, um, you know, uh, lymph nodes, adjacent lymph nodes, and if in histology it appears there is invasion, you probably should go back and clear it uh, with paraortic dissection. Um, I did um, sort of uh, get a special interest in limb salvage in, um, in vascular surgery, and part of that, we started getting referrals with limb salvage with bone tumors. Um, and these are very satisfying surgeries to do as, as well, because um, again, this is a young group of patients. Um, there is a lot of literature these days about limb salvage, especially with advanced joint and limb replacements. Um, they, they, they're doing amazing with these uh, amazing uh, modern joints where you can remove a whole um, knee, a whole shoulder, and uh, you, know, you, you replace it for a child or a young uh, man, and you, you preserve their, their limb. In the sarcomas especially, it's no more, you know, if the limb is affected, the limb goes, you can do a limb salvage, limb preserving um, surgery. Uh, this is one, uh, one example of such cases. Um, the incision you see is a typical of these patients. They come in with the incision which was done for histology, for histological uh, confirmation. And it's important to know where they've taken the histology from because in your surgical planning, you should excise that incision and the area adjacent to it with the uh, surgical excision. In these patients, um, frequently they're invading into vessels, either popliteal or femoral vessels, and uh, I, I usually sort of do the bypasses first, leave them a bit long, so patients will not get ischemic during the excision, do the excision, and if, then if I, short, I need to shorten bypasses, that's what I do. This is one example of such cases. I've done both the, the uh, arterial and the venous uh, anastomosis or uh, bypasses, uh, then went in to remove the tumor. Uh, as you can see, they're long a bit, and that's intentional. Once you put in the joint, the knee joint, then you, know, you measure it up. Uh, you know, if they don't sit, sit uh, appropriately, then uh, you can always shorten um, your, one of your bypasses with a simple primary anastomosis. A shoulder, this is a shoulder case with a sarcoma as well uh, in a young child. And, uh, you know, I've told you previously, you get these amazing prostheses these days, and you can completely replace the shoulder uh, girdle. We've done also uh, a bypass with these. It's not just the bypasses with these, it's also the assistance for your orthopedic colleagues for the proximal controls, uh, which was in this case very proximal. Um, axillary subclavian control um, for both the vein and, and the artery uh, in, and the dissection control, you know, the dissection assistance. And, and they very much evaluate this. And to be honest, once you take the program off the ground, um, you know, you start uh, gradually um, give the skills to your, to your orthopedic colleagues and some of the simpler cases or the cases that do not need um, anastomosis replacement, they will do themselves um, as well. So to, you know, to give you just a, a general um, uh, idea of uh, our experience, um, so we had uh, 66 uh, head and neck paralingiliomas, um, other uh, ENT tumors, which also, you know, and a lot of these get referred by the maxillofacial surgeons. Um, uh, they also invade into vessels and you need to replace 
these vessels. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I did not have the images to one impressive case I should have shared with you, which I've done um, during my practice uh, with the military in Afghanistan where it was a massive tumor invading the lower jaw and invading the vessels. And, uh, you know, we could excise the whole thing with replacement. It was great fun to do. Thoracic tumors, we had the three mediastinal tumors, uh, renal tumors, 18 of those, adrenal extraadrenal, three of those, limb salvage, 22, and retroperitoneal tumors, 17, and uh, five other tumors, including the abdominal wall tumors. And these very interesting, actually, to be honest, because they do mimic uh, vascular anomalies. And some people they misdiagnose them as, um, you know, AVMs. Uh, but uh, in histology, you find these are uh, some sort of uh, low um, malignancy sarcomas. In conclusion, there's a multidisciplinary teams uh, are essential for this sort of practice. You also need tumor boards because you know you can't, you know, the decision should be collective. Uh, as always, you should get oncologists on board and involved for the adjuvant therapy or for the post-operative follow-up follow -up as well. Out, um, outcome measures and long-term follow-ups uh, are essential uh, as well. Uh, I leave you with this quote from Sir Robert Jensen, which is uh, I greatly admire and I use in my practice. From, it's, a, it's a prayer from inability to live well alone, from too much zeal for what's new, for, from treating patients as cases, and from making the cure of a disease more grievous than its endurance, good Lord delivers. Thank you. Great. Very nice, very nice. I like it very much. Oh, thank you, Dr. Amir. You're so kind. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, really. It is very nice presentation, very nice topic, uh, very nice illustrative cases. I have just two questions. First, uh, for such unique surgery, What's your protocol for anticoagulation? So uh, it, it, it's, it's a very important question, um, uh, Dr. Ayman. Uh, I, I treat the vascular uh, problem. So to be honest, I'm aggressive anticoagulator. So I anticoagulate patients be, even before I start uh, cutting. Um, okay. uh, so I, I do anticoagulate him as soon as we get into the tumor because or into the uh, cavity, the abdomen, or limb, whatever it is we're, we're operating on. Um, I do not worry about, you know, uh, the side effects of anticoagulation uh, with the bleeding. And one, one thing that comes a bit with experience is speed with surgery. It, it speed does not mean uh, doing things hastily. You have to have the important steps done correctly. But once you do, uh, you know, long procedures, hypothermia, all the other things that cause bleeding, that's your enemy. It's not the anticoagulation. Anticoagulation is very important. And I, th what's important also, I emphasize, is anticoagulation post-operatively. So you keep these patients, because these are malignancy patients, so you keep them on full anticoagulation while in hospital and on prophylactic anticoagulation while at home at least for six weeks. And I can never forget one patient that unfortunately we lost um, you know, on the day he was discharged because of a PE, because he wasn't taking, we thought he was, uh, you know, he was given the appropriate anticoagulation and he apparently wasn't taking it. So anticoagulation is extremely important. Okay, uh, that's what exactly I want to hear. I think uh, Dr. Sergio want to make a question. Please, Dr. Sergio. Sure. And uh, so, sorry for having missed part of this, but uh, I had to take my ride home. If not, I was staying in the hospital forever. But uh, I, I really enjoy part of that. And I have a simple question for you, Mamoun. Uh, you're, of course, like a top expert in the field. And uh, we have recently enjoyed an editorial from Mansila on the shifting in the training of the residents in vascular surgery that are not like so much exposed to open surgery. So do you have some comments on the training of the new generation of surgeons that are so used to endovascular procedure and maybe less to open surgical ones? Well, thank you for bringing this up, Sergio. And I think it's a vital topic that a lot of us that are involved with training and with um, sort of on the international scene when it comes to certification and training. And in the Middle East, one of those regions that we're you know, working hard on uh, guaranteeing that uh, future vascular surgeons um, are uh, adequately trained in both uh, fields. It's a problem that all specialties are facing, to be honest, but none is so obvious than vascular surgery because we are getting to, you know, even with a simpler 
uh, vas well, you know, what we consider simpler vascular procedures like aneurysm repairs. We're getting to a stage where you know, uh, a trainee would probably see very little or no uh, aortic, open aortic repair in his practice because everything is done endovascularly. When it comes to that, this sort of uh, surgery, uh, you know, I, um, I cannot emphasize enough that our trainees should be involved with, with um, large surgeries or sort of meaning large, uh, you know, being uh, uh, aggressive uh, where they uh, go into all parts of the body because when they're asked for their expertise to save a life or to rescue a colleague from bleeding uh, somewhere, um, you know, they should be able to do it regardless of the anatomical um, area. How do we achieve that? You know, it's open to question and debate, to be honest, Sergio, and I think international consensus um, should come into the certification of surgeons before we let them lose, um, you know, with the practice, uh, what sort of um, skills they should have uh, when it comes um, to operating, open operation. We've done, we've done uh, some work with um, simulation and training surgeons on the virtual world it is never a full adequate replacement to the real world because they need still to do these surgeries. And do you think Arun, that it would be possible to create a sort of certi certified centers where residents can be sent so that you maybe set out some parameters of a certified centers for receiving uh, this? Uh, absolutely, I couldn't agree more, especially now that we all you know, come to the realization of the agreement that certain procedures should be done in high volume centers. And the more you sort of uh, make, make these, um, uh, you know, cases, send these cases to these centers, the less the other um, hospitals, the training uh, areas will have them. International cooperation, I think, is, is vital, to be honest. And, I, and we were looking um, a while ago with a, an international program. I've been lucky uh, throughout my practice that I've practiced uh, vascular surgery and transplant in five out of the six continents. So I've worked in many countries, Canada, New Zealand, England, etc. And I, I, we've worked on this program where you have an international, international exchange for um, trainees. There are a lot of obstacles and I think the only way to do it, to be honest, uh, is to do it through the main surgical bodies, be it the colleges, be it the societies, the major societies, um, or an independent uh, training, um, you know, organizing facility. But this is th this would be the ideal thing for the future. Congratulations! Thank you so much. No worries. Okay, Mamun, uh, this is nice, and we have many questions for you. I see Doctor uh, Mahmoud Salah uh, is. Uh, raising his hand and uh, do you want to ask uh, the question uh, yourself uh, professor mahmoud yes can you hear me uh, through ayman yes sure please yes yes mahmoud uh, amazing as usual and then now to all my good friend ahlan sir dr mahmoud how are you sir Allah, missing you so much uh, it was uh, yani, camera fantastic. show please mahmoud Allah Fantastic talk, uh, Mamoun, and I like very much when you said about the liver tumor that you need uh, just to repair the portal vein and inferior vena cava as if something uh, very easy. <laughs> <laughs> I can assure you many uh, closed their career without seeing the portal vein. But uh, anyhow, just uh, not to take much time, I want to ask you quest two questions about the carotid body tumor. Sure. When you have to sacrifice the internal carotid during this uh, surgery, what is your first option to replace the uh, carotid, whether the external carotid or artificial graft or vein? This is one question. And the other question, what would you do for bilateral carotid? And you do with two stages or one stage and how much space? Thank you, Mahmoud. Excellent questions. A replacement, I always use vein, vein grafts. Uh, and in all cases, we preoperatively map the veins so we know exactly if I need a vein, where to take it from. And it's usually the uh, proximal long uh, savanus in the thigh. And it's prepped and draped, ready to go if we need it in all cases. 
Um, these patients are usually young, and I don't like using uh, prosthetic for replacement. Well, for multiple reasons, but the um, the uh, vein grafts uh, are um, are excellent. Um, the external uh, carotid uh, I do not replace. So if it's excised, it's excised, it's done, uh, especially in the in unilateral uh, cases, uh, and they rarely get any symptoms from that. In fact, with the surgical maneuver, you use the external uh, carotid as a handle and you excise it early so you can move the tumor around uh, while you're operating. And it's a, it's, a, it's a good trick and technique. And you know, a lot of the carotid body tumor supply will come from the external carotid in addition to uh, occasionally, which is the mydal's ligament from the common. But um, you know, once you excise or clamp the external carotid, the supply will shrink as well, and that will help uh, the surgery uh, as well. Uh, when you get uh, bilateral carotid body tumors, uh, it's a staged procedure. So you do one side, make sure there are no complications uh, with them, uh, and uh, you know, at least uh, six uh, weeks later, um, you do uh, the other side. There is no hurry. These uh, tumors are benign, slow growing, and the patients, you know, they're ha happy they're diagnosed. Um, uh, the, the, you can plan the surgery um, at your uh, leisure. Um, the only thing not to leave them too long so that they change their Champlain classification, but uh, we never do them at the same time. Thank you very much. We have a question from Professor Tari Abdelazim. Uh, Professor Tari, one of the most eminent vascular surgeons, in, and he is also the head of the vascular department in Ain Shams University, one of our big universities. Please, Professor Tari. Uh, thank you, Omar. Thank you, Dr. Maoun, for an, ex for an excellent presentation. I just have a comment and the question. The comment is, I fully agree with your policy regarding preoperative embolization for carotid body tumors. We have not found that to be helpful at all, like you mentioned, and uh, it doesn't really seem to decrease the vascularity of the tumor intraoperative, plus the fact that it does, as you have clearly mentioned, have its own share of complications. So I agree fully with you as, uh, regarding this point. My question is about renal cell carcinoma patients that have extension up through the IVC and into the right atrium. What's your sequence for dealing with these patients? Do you open the chest first and have the, the cardiac surgeons put the patient on bypass first and then do the abdominal part? Or do you start with the abdominal part with some risk of something embolizing upstairs? Thank you. Th thank you, Tariq. That's a, that's a great question. Um, now, we had um, a couple of cases with right atrial uh, invasion, and we've used two methods uh, with them. Uh, one with a complete cardiac um, arrest, hypothermic uh, arrest. Obviously, a cardiac surgeon colleague uh, on board uh, with that. Um, and what we've done, we've done, we, we've opened the abdomen done the uh, initial dissection of the tumor. So when you're ready for the excision, um, you're, you know, you're, um, uh, you're ready to go and uh, it doesn't take much time because that's where most of the time it's gonna happen is the hepatic rotation, is the uh, obtaining controls of the vessels, is uh, rotation of the tumor itself. So when you're ready to go, you open the chest, go on to hypothermic arrest, and then you can open the atrium, extract it, and you know, do. Uh, to be honest, I did not like that at all. The surgery in that case did not go that well, not because of the surgery itself, because of the um, uh, post-operative uh, coagulopathic complications. And although our, our rest time was very short, it, they, did, they did get into massive uh, coag coagulopathy. The other one is the uh, is you know um, uh, we've used uh, a different uh, maneuver, which is um, keeping them sort of um, um, uh, off pump all the time until we're ready to go with the removal, um, and then we put them on pump temporarily just to open the atrium and back to uh, you know once you close the atrium, opening the atrium, removing the clot is so quick and so fast it doesn't take much, uh, and I think and I prefer this method. Uh, to do. We had one other case where the embolization happened uh, intraoperatively uh, from manipulation of the tumor uh, of the cava, and that's before I used to use, I started using the slinging of the supradiaphragmatic uh, IVC 
uh, and we found that on um, you know um, uh, doing the echo the transesophageal echo uh, then we had to go and pump and open the atrium and remove the tumor so th that would be the appropriate technique in my opinion the section of the tumor ready to go then you open the atrium remove the tumor from the atrium and by which time you excise the abdominal tumor okay thank you very much no worries. thank you dr tari it was a very good question and uh, it won't, uh, uh, it must be answered very clear as uh, dr mahmoud said uh, now i think uh, omar uh, uh, we all thank Professor Ma'moon and uh, our, pa our panelists. Uh, I think uh, this is time for polling question, Omar. Yes, yes, it's time for polling question. And I would like to welcome Professor Victor Canata and uh, like to invite him on to the panelists. Uh, he's the attendee, so he can join us as the panelists. And then we're ready for the second poll. Okay, the second poll, how long do you recommend the post-interventional use of graduated compression stocking after endovenous laser therapy? How long do you recommend post-intervention use of graduated stocking? A, for one week or less, B, more than a week, or C, not at all? And I would like to extend my thanks to Sigvaras Group for sponsoring uh, our webinar. So if you can select which one do you use and submit your question, we usually get uh, 20 to 30 seconds for the result, which will be, to me, will be very interesting, especially as a preparation for the next great lecture by Raoul from India, one of the most eminent uh, laser uh, venous therapists worldwide. Um, so can we see the result of the poll? Oh, hello. Welcome, Raul. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Hello. How are you? Hello. Hi. Not too bad. Hi. So 70% uh, said more than a week, and 27% said one week or less. And only 4% said not at all. So it's back to you, Professor Ayman. Okay, that's great. Expected answer. Thank you. Uh, now I am honored to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Victor Canetta from uh, Paraguay and uh, Dr. Jafair Serlet uh, from Mexico joining uh, our uh, panel. It's a great honor for us. And uh, now it's time to welcome Professor Raul Jindel, the director of vascular uh, uh, clinic on, of Fortis Hospital in Mohali, India, <coughs> chairman of uh, governing council and uh, uh, past president of uh, Venus Association of India, executive member of International Compression Club, uh, member of the education, uh, a group of, of the uh, UIP, treasurer of Asian Venus Forum. Uh, uh, thank you, Raul. And uh, now he is going to discuss one of the most important uh... Hello, Raul. Uh, he is going Yeah, I, I can basics later in varicose veins treatment. The mic is yours, Raul, please. Thank you and good evening and uh, welcome and to all my friends from all over the world. I'm really sorry I got stuck up in an iliac rupture, so I had to rush from the hospital. Uh, so I just came home, so I'm uh, slightly in the hyper mode, so I'm really uh, sorry for that. But it's a very important topic, and uh, uh, and I, I, you know, there are very important things I really want to discuss. And I was speaking to Sergio in the afternoon, and uh, you know, I asked uh, some help from him also in the evening. And uh, I'll start this uh, topic, and I'll cover it in two topics. Uh, 
uh, two uh, parts. One is the basics of laser physics, which I see as a philo uh, you know as a philologist or as a vascular surgeon. You know, we must know the laser physics because sometimes I hear these questions being asked on our forum. You know, what should we use an antibiotic laser? Should we do 980? Why should we use 1470? Should we use 1940? You know, a lot of these questions are being asked. But you know, we must understand really the basics. Then you will be able to answer all these questions in one go. So that's why please don't get uh, you know bored with the physics. But it's very important. I have tried to make it very simple. You know, you'll be very surprised to know that lasers started in Egypt. So Egyptians were the one of the first guys, you know, which has been reported that they used the lasers, and uh, you know, there has been used in the treatment of vitiligo. After that, you know, there have been a lot of people who have been trying to use the laser in different uh, indications. So what is laser? Laser stands for light application by stimulated emission of radiation. So how is different from the normal light? You see, if you look into the laser, I put in some diagrams on the left side, you see it's monochromatic. What that means is, so as you know, each light goes through the prism, makes a rainbow. So it has only one color. Second is it's unidirectional. So it will go only in one direction. So it will not like a light bulb or the tube, which here the light goes all around. And second is collimated, means all the beam will be parallel. It will not be non-collimated. So it can, it will not be go like this. It will be all parallel together. So this is a very important uh, difference between laser and other lights. So important to understand is, how does the laser gets generated? Because you know we hear Andy Wyke laser, KTP laser, all those lasers. But what's the difference? So laser is you know on the top if you can see this diagram. So there is a high voltage source outside the tube. So high voltage source could be anything. It could be a chemical. It could be a diode. It could be another laser, and it could be anything which will excite the atoms which are present inside this gas discharging tube. So now this tube can contain anything, what we call is an active medium. So if you have a solid crystals, it's called as a solid laser. You could have a liquid like dye, what we call dye laser. You could have a gas inside this, like a CO2, helium, neon. Then you will say CO2 laser, helium laser, neon laser, you could have an NDYG. NDYG has two components. One is solid component and one is a liquid component. So combination of solid and liquid, then we call it as an NDYG laser. You could have a diode. You know what we see here, diode laser, 8110, 980, 1074. So all these things all depends upon what sort of an active medium you use in the tube. All these active medium can be excited by an external source. So once the atom gets excited, all the electrons will go on the top, they will be excited. And once they come back to a normal stage, they release what we call as photons. It's a very simple thing. So they will release an energy. So when they release the photons, they have to strike somewhere. So in this tube, we have got one side, a complete reflector. So the photon will go and strike the reflector and come back again. And there is only a one output, what we call as a partial reflector from where the laser will go out. And we can actually select what site of, what sort of laser can go out. Example, if you put an Andy Wyke medium inside the tube and we excite it, you know how many lasers can come out? It can give you around seven to eight type of lasers which can come out. But we can choose what we want. So we can also use an NDY 532. We can use an NDY 1064. So if we can choose what sort of wavelength we want the laser fiber to come out. So there is a technique to do that. So this is how we produce the laser. So you know, very basic thing to understand. So this is, I've just explained, once the excitation of the atoms is there, so they all get reflected in between each other, and then they come out from one hole, a laser is taken out. Now, once you understand this, then once the laser comes out, it interacts with the tissues in a different ways. So basically four way different ways. One is it can reflect. Second, it can scatter. Third is it can transmit through the tissues. 
and fourth is the absorption. And for us, the two important things is the transmission and the absorption, which is very, very important. By which all these four methods, it will cause you either a thermal reaction, it will cause you a chemical reaction, or it will mechanically damage the tissues. So all these things, we take the benefit out of it. Now, chromophore is very important to understand. You know, we, all these company guys, they keep on telling you, now 1470 is coming up, now 1940 is coming up because it absorbs, gets better absorbed by the water. So there are basically four chromophores by which all nearly laser works. One is the melanin, hemoglobin, water, and the tattoo inks. So we play around with these four chromophores. So you have to understand it's very straightforward, simple thing. So when we look into the laser type for tissue effects, so there could be an ablative and non-ablative. So it's very self-explanatory. If you are ablative, it's very strong, like a CO2 laser, and it will just take the tissue off. Non-ablative lasers are very soft, so they will heat the skin, but they will not damage the tissue. Now, this is a very important spectrum to understand. You know, you know visible light, and you know the mnemonic uh, Vibgeor means all the visible light spectrum. So that varies from 400 to 700 nanometers, so which is there in the center. So on one spectrum, on the left side, we got Vibgeor, V means a uh, violet color. So anything below this will be an ultraviolet. So below it, ultraviolet. And below that will be an X-rays, gamma rays, and cosmic rays. And ultraviolet rays are further divided into ultraviolet rays A, B, and C. And these are shorter wavelengths. But when we go to the right of the red, right of the visible spectrum of the red, is called infrared because it's below the red. So it's called infrared. So when we call near infrared, middle infrared, and far infrared rays. And below that, we get microwaves, radar, radio waves, and all. So this is very important to understand this. So when we talk about 810 nanometer, the first laser, what we use in the practice, that falls near infrared, as you can understand. It's an 810 nanometer. So it's a near infrared rays, which we generate. When we talk about 980 nanometer, which we use the second laser, so we call about near infrared. Then we go to 1074 NDY, which we use for cosmetic lasers, for the Clark's technique. So that goes also the infrared. Then we go to 1470, which we use the laser in the varicose veins, that falls into the far infrared. So that's how the spectrum works. So if you look into this spectrum, so it's a very, very important slide. So you look into this, in the visible light, you got a lot of lasers which are there. Argon, Andy Wyke 532, dye lasers, Alexandrite, Ruby, you know, all those lasers. These lasers, they all are very superficial lasers. So they don't penetrate deep. The reason is because they've got a shorter wavelength. So in the visible spectrum, all these lasers, they have got shorter wavelengths, so they cannot penetrate deep. The higher the wavelengths you go into the infrared spectrum, you can see Andy Weig 1064, Andy Weig Holmium laser 2140, Erbium laser, Erbium Weig 2900, CO2 laser, which is the biggest, 10,000 nanometer. So the depth of penetration increases as the wavelength increases. So that's very important. So that's why people ask, why don't we use KTP laser or the dyed laser for Clark's procedure? You cannot because the vessels are deeper. So you need to use a longer wavelength laser. There are other reasons for that also. I'll come to that. Now, this is a very important spectrum to understand. Look into this. You got in the visible spectrum, 400 to 700 nanometers, you got maximum absorption of HBO2 and melanin. So where is the water? It's not there, okay? So if you are working on this spectrum, there is no water absorption by the any lasers. Now look into this. It's very important to understand this. Look into that, the black line, that's a melanin line. So as the wavelength goes up, the melanin absorption goes down. Hemoglobin absorption goes down. And look at the where does the water absorption starts after 900 nanometers. So we used to use 810. That was the first diode laser which we used to use. And still it used to work. 
it used to have 94 to 97% occlusion rates. So how does the 810 nanometer laser work without water capacitance? Okay, so it used to be absorbed by the hemoglobin and still it used to work. Such a good closure rate. So what's the problem? I'll come to that later on. It's very interesting. So if you look into the KTP diode, all those lasers, so they work on this spectrum of three chromophores, which we talked about, melanin, hemoglobin, and the water. So that's the basic concept. If you go higher up, if you look into our, our let's say what we are interested in, let's look at NDY 1064. Look at the spectrum of water absorption. It's very low. So water absorption is just started, but we still use NDY for the cosmetic reasons because we want the maximum absorption into the hemoglobin molecule, not into the water. So that's why we are using this. I, I'll, I'll tell you later on as you keep on going. So now this is a chart which is given by the companies. What that means is that if you use 1470 nanometer, you get less water absorption. So that's why I use 1940 laser, a new laser, because it has got more water absorption. But at the same time, it has got also got hemoglobin absorption also, HbO2. So this was another chart which was given that if you use 1470 as compared to 1940, 1940 get more four times more water absorption of the laser. So that's why we should use 1940 instead of 1470. So this is how we make the NDY laser. You know, this is the lasing tube inside and we put in the solid component called jetrium aluminium and garnet and we combine it with a chemical agent called neodymium and we activate it through any route. You know, as I told you, you can use anything and then you can get various types of laser out of it. And then you can select what sort of laser you want for your machine, so for the treatment. So there are machines by which you can modify this, the same component, and you can get 1064 also, and you can also get 940 nanometer laser from the same machine. Now coming to NDVIG, why I'm telling, talking about NDVIG is because we use it for the Clark's procedure. So I'm covering the superficial and the deep veins both together. So it uses a lower power, it is offers high gain, it has got good thermal properties, good mechanical properties, and efficacy of is very high as compared to ruby laser. Remind you, ruby laser was a very strong laser in the visible spectrum, somewhere around 500 to 600, and it's very strong, but it's very superficial. Coming to the basic terminology. Now these five words we have to know. And that's why it gets confusing, but it, they are very simple. So wavelengths, we have already learned. You know, we have already covered it and how it works, but we'll learn slightly more about it. Then the fluency. Fluency is the energy. Then the pulse width, thermal relaxation time, and pulse repetition time. And all these five components are very important if you want to treat these patients. I'll go one by one. Coming to the wavelengths. If you have a shorter wavelength, like in the visible spectrum, it has got less depth and photons carry a lot of energy. So that's why if you use a visible spectrum lasers, there is a very high chance that you will burn the skin. If you have a longer wavelength, it penetrates deep into the tissues and photons carry a smaller proportion of energy. The chances of complications are much lesser. Now this is how it works like. So if you look into the totally the center, our area of interest, NDY1064, it goes very deep and it can reach into the reticular veins area and it can reach into the, you know, the dermis area and can treat the, all the uh, telling jetasias which we require it to be treated. Similarly, if you look into this, the depth of penetration increases as the wavelength increases. Coming to the fluency. So what is fluency is joules. Joules is the amount of power which we want from the machine. So in terms of wattage, like we want eight watts, we want nine watts, we want 10 watts. So how much energy you want to be delivered to the tissues? And if we say we want to deliver 10 watts in one centimeter area, that gives you joules per centimeter square area. So that means a fluency. 
Now, coming to this concept of leads, or we have all heard about leads, that we should keep the leads like this and this. There are a lot of publications which are against the leads, and they say it's really, really effective rather than the total energy given. I'll give you an example. Let's say we want to deliver 10 watt of energy per centimeter. So we say 10 watt given per centimeter. And so how much is that fluency is 10 into 1, 10, 100. And so let's say we give the same amount of energy. We want to give 10 joules. So I just decrease the amount of energy to 0.1 watt and give it at 0 0.01 millimeter distance. In the time will be more, the energy I have reduced, the distance is the same, but it will not produce the same effects. So if I calculate the lead, the lead will be the same in both the categories, but the total energy delivered will be the same so leads will be the same, but I will not get, if I burn the vein at a, such a small uh, energy in, the whole cent in that whole centimeter area, the vein will not get closed. So that's the drawback of the leads. So people who are against the leads, so they put in this justification. Coming to the pulse is in that particular time, in that laser beam when it fires and how much pulses you want to give. If you want to give the pulse in milliseconds, you want to give in nanoseconds, or you want to give in picoseconds. The, the difference between this is, if you want to give the energy just like that, it becomes a picoseconds. I'll just explain that. Coming to the pulse duration, so the amount of time you want to deliver the laser energy to a particular point is called pulse duration. And this is very important because you can have a smaller pulse width and a larger pulse width. So why it's important is this because of this, because you can give if you have a shorter pulse width or you're going to want a longer pulse width. It's very important because the pulse duration, any laser you want to use, it must be less than the thermal relaxation time. So what is thermal relaxation time is? So let's say I'm giving the laser energy to the skin and what I want to burn, let's say uh, a small pigment, which is there, but I want to give, I cannot give a pulse duration too high. Otherwise I will burn the surrounding skin. So I have to give the pulse duration only up to that time, unless that skin which gets heated, it also gets relaxed at the same time. So every molecule, every chromophore has got a different thermal relaxation time. So this is a very important chart to understand this. Leave the melanosomes and the cells, look at the blood vessels where we are interested. So let's see, you are treating a 200 micrometer diameter vessel, you know, uh, telling that is here. Thermal relaxation time for that is 20 milliseconds. So you need to keep the pulse width on your instrument less than 20 milliseconds. So maybe around 15 milliseconds. If you are treating the diameter of 500, the TRT is more. So you have to use a less uh, you can increase the pulse width a bit more. So you have to keep the pulse width below the TRT time. Next is the spot size. Smaller the spot size, smaller penetration. Larger the spot size, you get more penetration and you can cover a bigger area so you can treat the treatment faster. So if you have a very small vessel, you can keep a small spot size. Larger vessel, you can keep a larger spot size. Now, this is a very important slide. I really like it. It say WTF. You can understand what it means. What it shows is on the left side, if you have a shorter wavelength, you keep shorter wavelengths like a KTP laser, visible spectrum lasers, as we discussed. It will be superficial. Short pulse width will be superficial. Small spot size will be superficial. And low fluency. Low fluency means less wattage because you don't want to put in too much energy. Longer wavelength will go deeper. Longer pulse width will go deeper. Larger spot size will go deeper and higher fluency will go deeper. So this is how we choose. So if you have a superficial lesion, you choose the left, left side. If you have a deeper lesion, you choose the right side. So achieving the optimum is you have to select three things importantly. One is the wavelengths. 
what you want to treat. A second is exposure duration. And third is the fluency, how much energy you want to damage that tissue. Now, this is uh, one of the last slides of this uh, spectrum is, you can have a continuous spectrum of laser. So the where the beam is fired continuously. So it really produces very high power. Then you can have a pulsed laser where higher energies are given for a shorter duration pulse. Then another system is in the newer machines is a Q switch. A Q switch is extremely high energy, which we use, but for very small pulse. And then we have a Q switch at the picosecond where absolutely shorter pulse durations are used. Now, why I'm telling you here is the Q switch is very important if you want to use it for uh, you know, post sclerotherapy pigmentation. So you can use this technology because you get this pigmentation there. You can use a picosecond or nanoseconds uh, NDYAC 1064 laser to take this pigments out. Uh, let's say leave this. Now coming to the endovenous laser, you want me to stop here, Dr. Ayman, or I can't hear you. Sorry. Okay, yes, yes uh, we can could... take a break to take a few questions. Yeah. Yes, uh, I think it is very important and very nice presentation, very basic, and I think uh, we'll have many questions because uh, it is uh, very hard to to understand. I think. Dr. Uh, Dr. Ayman, you know what is happening? This was the basics because now all this will be applied in the clinical yeah. setup. So, yes, it is. Uh, so I was thinking of completing the lecture because then people may be asking the questions which are there already in the lecture. Because I'll be applying all these basics now into the clinical setup. Let me check who is raising his hand. Okay, fine. Uh, we have uh, we have three questions, but they can wait until the next part. Uh, Raul, I know this is the preparation for his next part, and then. We can take question at the end. Okay, okay. let's the second part. Okay. Go on. Thank you. Now, well, you know, this, this was a study. I got it. Uh, you know, it was uh, Suroka et al. published in 2013. It's a very important study. Uh, this is one of uh, very few studies published where they have done the comparison between 980 nanometer, 1470, and 1940 nanometer. So in our so, setup, we are using all these three lasers. You know, actually I started with 18, 810, but then moved to 980, then 1470, and we have six months we have been using 1940. So you look into the basic diagram which they have put in the histological. So I'm just presenting his study. So what I have shown is that we're in the first 980, we were using higher energies. So we were using the leads of 150 or 130 joules per centimeters. And we used to have more carbonization, more perforation. Then we move to 1470, we use less leads, maybe 60 to 70 joules per centimeter. You have a circular thermal alteration. Then we move to 1940, we use much lesser energy, 30 to 40 joules per centimeter. You get circular thermal alteration with vacuolization, so less damage to the vessel, or more damage to the vessel up to the outer part of the media or the adventitia. Sorry, just a minute. Happened to it. So he did two trials. One was he used the 1940 radial fiber with a higher energy, four to nine watts, with a continuous pull up and put in the joules of 40 to 90 joules per centimeter. And it compared to the other trial where he used a lesser energy, two to four watts and uh, where he used a lesser energy, 20 to 40 joules per centimeter as a leads, and around 150 patients were there in both the groups. So this was the setup, uh, radial fiber, 600 uh, micrometers, uh, you know, at the wing and post-operative uh, patients were evaluated at six months, one year, two years. And they looked at the basic, all the setups like stump lens, vein diameter, seep, and the safety profile and all the drawbacks, what we all know. The important thing is they found that at day three and six months, the occlusion rates were on 98 to 100%. Recanalization with the reflux was zero to 1.8%. And reflux in ASSV was zero because it was sort of a laser cross -ectomy. 
and you know various seed classifications were involved in this group and if you look at the basic side effects you know pig pigmentation ecchymosis filibitis they were all very uh, very small numbers you know 1 to 2% so not much drawbacks and i think if you look into a lot of 1470 trials they have got the similar outcomes when we looked at the pain score and taking analgesics and analgesics so they were very basic so they were not very a huge number which were involved and when we looked at all the 1940 uh, literature which has been published if you look into these uh, uh, publications which are there so they got uh, various numbers uh, which are their level of evidence and they all show uh, a very good results you know at 6 months to 2 years follow up and it shows 96 99% closure rates so it all the conclusions are it's effective, safe, high patient comfort, reduced laser power, and further follow-up and more clinical trials is required. So as we, you know, we used to have by 1470. And all these publications, they say, the so future is longer wavelengths, 1940, maybe a bit more because the water is going up, as I showed you. Reduced power, more reduced power, reduced amount of timescence, radial fibers, standardization of treatment protocols, slow continuous pullbacks and shorter stumps. So this is what we think. So now I put in three, four slides. So when mm -hmm. I went to all the literature and whatever knowledge I had, so there were a lot of things which I could not understand. You know, when we look into all the publication published on endovenous laser therapy, we still don't know how the laser therapy closes the vessel. There are basic five mechanisms which has been published in all the publications. So one is the bubble theory. What that means is that at the tip of the fiber, there is a carbonization. And when there is a mild carbonization, the tip of the laser fiber, the temperature increases up to 100 degrees centigrade. And once the temperature reaches 100 degrees, it produces bubbles. And these bubbles, they transfer and travel and they travel and cause the heat dissipation to the vein wall. You see, the basic concept in endovenous laser therapy is we want that the vessel wall gets damaged by the heat and it gets fibrosed and it gets closed. So that's a basic aim. So how does the heat goes into the vein wall? So one is the concept is by bubbles. So bubble travels approximately two centimeters proximal towards the foot side up the laser fiber. Second concept was a direct contact. So this was the first concept of endovenous laser therapy when we were using 810 nanometer that the laser fiber closes the vein by direct contact because at that point we were using the bare fibers. So the bare fiber will contact the vein wall, it will heat the vein wall and it will get damaged. Then there came the concept of blood coagulant. What that means is there is a blood in the vein you cannot empty the vein fully, 100%. And as soon as you fire the laser, the blood gets coagulated. So you get a thrombus formed there. It got a lot of heat. And the heat from the thrombus, the hemoglobin part, gets uh, to the vein wall. And then the vein wall gets destroyed. The fourth concept was a heat dissipation. Means from the laser fiber itself, from the tip, the heat gets dissipated into the vein wall. And the four, fifth concept was the carbonization. What that means is this is one of the basic concepts that all the laser fibers will get mild carbonization at the top, resulting in increased temperature of the tip and resulting in a heat dissipation from the carbonization into the vein wall. And the sixth concept which is there is that where does the laser energy gets absorbed from the laser fiber? Is it gets absorbed into the water molecules? or it gets absorbed into the hemoglobin molecules. As I told you before, 810 nanometers does not have a water absorption, so it's still blocked. Second, a lot of publications are there that the heat gets, you know, the, the blood has got more than 60% component as a water. So the most of the heat from the laser energy will get absorbed into the blood rather than the water in the vein wall. So there have been few studies which shows that the laser energy gets absorbed into the water of the vein wall directly. So if you look into the lot of physics, it doesn't make sense. If you look into a lot of publication, it doesn't make sense. So 
according to me and according to all the literature that i have gone through is that the heat really goes directly into the water of the vein wall unless you totally make the blood the vein totally bloodless then that may be the issue which is there so that's why uh, a question that 1470 laser or a 1940 laser will it going to make a difference i really don't think so so what wavelength because really water is important because we don't know exact mechanism why the vein blocks so there are four to five mechanisms and a lot of publications are there on each each one of them if you go into detail so really uh, what wavelength you should use it doesn't make a difference yes the type of fiber it makes a difference then there is a study published where they showed that the carbonization rate in all the laser fibers so what it means is you take up any laser fiber there will be a small layer of carbonization which is seen by a microscope on all the laser fiber tips what that laser carbonization does it as you know if you take the laser fiber and put it into the air and put it on or into the water the temperature at the tip of the laser fiber does not increase is nearly zero and if you put this laser fiber into the blood component the temperature goes to with a mild carbonization to 100 but if you get a proper carbonization at the tip of the laser fiber the temperature can go up to 1000 to 1200 degrees centigrade so very high temperature can be there at the tip but small carbonization which happens in the top puts in a lot of heat at the tip of the laser fiber that dissipates heat so this is one of the basic mechanism for damaging the vein now coming to the fiber types bayer fibers radial fibers yes as compared to the wave fiber radial fibers are different because radial fiber the heat is dissipated equally all around and in over a period of segment of 1 cm maybe that's why it gives you a better closer but we still don't have a theoretical or you know a full proof uh, about this if you look into the physics if you look into superficial lesions why nd back as i told you it's a stable laser depth more than other lasers it targets both hemoglobin which is present inside and also target the myoglobin which is present in the vein wall and also the water so why not the other lasers they are very strong as i told you they are very superficial but they can be useful for facial veins you know and there is a basic difference between facial veins and the varicose veins if you look into the facial veins the diameter you know if you look into the vein wall the diameter of that vein wall is uh, not the diameter i should say the width of the vein wall is approximately 5 to 10 micrometer if you look into the varicose veins it varies from 50 micrometers to 500 to 600 micrometers so the facial veins are very thin and they are very superficial so we can use the ktp over there as compared to nd vac now this is a very important if you look into this um, uh, i don't know if you can see the chart selective photothrombolysis by ndvig so 1064 is selectively absorbed by hpo2 in hp much more than the water as i told you if you look into the water molecule in the beginning only the 1064 molecule is there so that's why if you are treating the clarks there should be a blood in the blood vessels so in the telangia tcrs or in the spider veins there should be blood present there because if there is no blood present there the results will be bad so that's why if you are using the coolant system along with it if you put in the coolant system for a very long time the vessels goes into spasm the blood disappears from the blood vessels and you will not get good results so here it's opposite you want the blood to be there in telangia tcrs because that's how the 1064 is going to target it does not target anything else another why we use this is because it has got uh, more depth and second is it does not get absorbed by the melanin very low component so that's why so you will not get much skin damage especially you know in the type 4 type 5 type 6 darker color people because they have got lot of melanin if you use the previous lasers early lasers ktp and all they can be absorbed mainly by the melanin because of the melanin curve which we discussed so at the wavelength of 1064 melanin is a weak chromophore so we got higher safety margins are there 
and that's why we can use a higher energy so that we can damage the blood vessel so this is we use an elma machine you can use any machine which is a source for ndy and you got various tips which are available there now that's a very important uh, tip which is there mostly you know we use either 2 to 6 mm tip and as i told you 2 mm tip means a small uh, diameter tip and 6 mm tip will go deeper 2 mm tip will be on the superficial and looking into the world spirit and the energy densities as i told you fluency means the power how much power you want to give so you want to burn more you give more flames pulse width is as i told you depending upon the size of the vessels so normally if you look into the telling jtcs and all so we use around 15 to 45 milliseconds normally we use a 6 mm tip and normally we, in terms of fluency we can use 30 to 45 or or 50 60 50 to 60 uh, fluency depending upon the skin of the person so that's why this which we discussed before thermal relaxation time is very important so if you have a smaller diameter vessel then you keep your pulse width smaller so you keep the pulse width at 12 lesser than the 20 milliseconds so that's very important so if you want to keep pulse width of 15 then you can keep up to the diameter of 200 micrometer vessel but if the vessel is very small let's say 100 micrometers so then you cannot use this pulse width of 12 so you need to use a lower pulse width so this is a very important last slide as i told you the spot size is very important depending on the diameter and the depth so smaller vessel smaller spot size pulse duration we have already discussed fluency we already discussed now fluency is very important smaller the vessel higher the fluency higher the energy we have to use the reason for that is because if you have a smaller vessel you have less hemoglobin there so less hemoglobin means more power is required to burn it if you have a bigger vessel you got lot of hemoglobin where the laser energy will be absorbed then you can use a lower fluency so it's opposite so smaller vessel will require a higher fluency and a larger vessel will require a lower fluency so this is the sort of a setup what we uh, what we have if you look into the left side is a pulse width you need to adjust depending upon the thermal relaxation time which depends upon the thermal uh, the vessel size then you have a fluency which we have already discussed and the spot size you can keep 2 to 6 mm and the cooling we you can keep around 75 to 100% uh this is just depending upon the protocol what we have depending upon the skin type because uh you have to follow uh, you know once you do it keep on doing it then you remember this that fairer people have got less melanin and so you need to be careful uh, about what uh, sort of powers you are using so in the end i'll say be a responsible laser clinician and uh, so you should know uh, your equipment very well before you start using it thank you great very nice presentation i think uh, we learned a lot about the basics and the amplification of uh, laser mm -hmm. and i think uh, it's time to have some comments and uh, questions yes from questions yes we uh, we are delighted to have uh, properly with us Uh, he did give a fascinating lecture in China this morning, and he had a question that wanted to say uh, to Raoul. So you can ask your question, uh, uh, Mark, and you can uh, unmute yourself. Sure. Thank you. Welcome, Professor. I sorry I missed your lecture today because I was stuck in some emergency today, whole day. So, so, uh, it, it, it's lovely, isn't it? The one thing we've learned about COVID nineteen is you can talk to China in the morning, Egypt in the afternoon. <laughs> it's fantastic. No, no. <laughs> that, that was a wonderful. Hmm? It's midnight uh, over here. <laughs> oh, midnight! Oh, <laughs> it's early evening here. Just just in time for a wine later on. Um, that was a masterful uh, talk. I thought that was absolutely fantastic, and I wrote my question halfway through. And I think you might have come across it and answered. I'm very interested in the absorption 
uh, of the wavelengths for endovenous surgery. We, we know that with 1470 nanometers, there's quite a lot of transmission before the full absorption. Because if we forget 1940 and we go to the ablative lasers like the 10600, which is another 10 times further on, you shine that at a surface and ablate it, it doesn't even penetrate at all. So we've done a bit of work, which you probably know, with the 1940. And although you know, we work for very thin layers, you know, is it very thin so you get some transmission, it might be absorbed more. When we're talking about veins and we're looking at the heat transfer and the amount of energy you put in with 1470 and in 1940 actually is more or less the same. It's just the, how it's absorbed. I mean, I don't know what your feeling of that is, but I don't think wavelength makes that much difference between the two. Yeah. You see, Mark, uh, I've been uh, from last one year because we started using 1940 around six months back. And then I got really interested into the physics of lasers. I thought, right, let me get into this. Really, is there a difference? Because, you know, all the book chapters, whatever we read, they put in only very superficial. And from six months, I've been just reading and reading about this. And then I started, came to know, actually talking, uh, it's, if you keep on reading the publication on the laser physics, please keep on knowing more and more that actually talking, we don't know how does they work. And if you look into the concept, because whatever the machines or whatever the literature we hear that, you know, the heat energy from the laser 1470 or whatever, uh, it gets better because it's absorbed more by the water molecule, as, uh, as I mentioned here. It actually, there is not a single laser physics paper which supports this idea. And actually talking, there has been publications, to, sorry to say this here, there are a lot of publications which are there which are actually anti-company. They say they don't want you to learn the laser physics as a philobologist. Because if you learn all the, about the laser physics, then it will be very difficult to sell you the machines. Because, uh, you know, th th there are a lot of publications published. And if you look into this, approximately uh, 13 publications I have on this against that there is not much difference. Because that's why I went into the basics of laser physics. Really, how does the laser work? And how exactly it works? Where does the laser get energy gets absorbed? And if you look into, uh, there is a, a guy from it who is uh, actually uh, the godfather of laser. If you look into the dermatology, plastic books and all, he is the godfather. And he has written a book on laser. I got that book uh, uh, from there. And he has mentioned everywhere that the whatever we know that the heat energy from there forms uh, gets first absorbed by the blood in the vessel, not by the water in the vein wall. And because uh, with the various theories and principles that the nearest to the laser fiber, whatever the things are, first they will absorb the energy, then the heat energy will be absorbed by the other molecules. So there will be some molecule water in the vein wall which will be absorbed. And second is, uh, you know, all the other theories which I mentioned, which are being documented. And another very important point which I came, you know, try to understand was when we use an 810 nanometer, it used to work. And there was no by the water molecule. So how will you explain that? You know? I think I think one of the interesting things, and I totally agree with you, the, the thing is we we so we don't really know what the chrome force because yeah. in the cell wall, I mean if you think about the cell, you've got all the lipids, you've got the RNA, the DNA, you've got so many molecules, there's bound to be more than just the chrome force that we look at. The the all these different molecules that are going to be sitting there inside the cytoplasm. So there are going to be other chromophores, which we don't mention very often. So I think we're talking about predominant chromophores. Yeah, but Mark, that's why I put in the chromophores. The basic principles of lasers are, they have to be absorbed by the chromophores. Otherwise, they will not work. So uh, the fat, you know, because it has to be absorbed by the, if there's a fat globule, there is a water inside it that absorbs the laser, not the fat. So you have to understand there are only four chromophores. Uh, it's a hemoglobin, melanin, water, and the tattoo. So, no, that's, that's, only, not, 
No, those, are the, those are the four we measure, but that's because what we don't do is we don't actually go back and we don't look at, um, you know, does DNA absorb, is a DNA equivalent four foot eight to 10 nanometers? We don't draw the same curves. We only draw the curves of the, the, the molecules that we actually are interested in. But the fact that 8, 10 nanometers works shows that there are other chromophores in some way in the vein wall. We know it's not as strong as hemoglobin, but there are some other chromophores in there. Um, we, and there's lots of different chromophores. It's, it's just which ones we bother to, to measure and do the curves. Great. This is great. I think you, you both have a point. Uh, Mark, you add a, lo uh, a lot by discussing the absorption, which is uh, very important. <laughs> and you are right, Raul, we have only four chromosomes. Uh, uh, and I think uh, Sergio wants to add something. Sure. 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 Thank Hi. So first of all, I have to say that I have the chance of marrying uh, Raul in, on the clinical theater. It was uh, amazing. On the stage, it was outstanding. Now he's also a physicist online. So my admiration can't stop, of course. But um, I just wanted to bring some with you on a joke. You know, the joke that are saying, why do you keep on banging your head against the wall? Because I like it so much when I stop doing that. <laughs> so... So the thing is, in 2010, I read a very nice paper of Swat Doganji that should be here with us today. And it was 10 years ago, comparing 1980 with 1470, showing that basically there was no significant difference in the occlusion rate. Yeah. Now, six years later, they showed us uh, that 46% of the energy is lost in the carbonization of the tip of, uh, of the laser fiber, as you correctly pointed out before. We had some experiences with all new lasers showing about the importance of uh, the cooling effect of the blood that is flashing on the laser. And we know how heterogeneous uh, the tumescence can be done by one operator rather than the other. In 2018, they published a nice paper showing that if you do a meta-analysis of all the data we have, it's a perfect storm of unuseful data. So before going to bed tonight, can you tell us how we should really design a study on laser to make it uh, pretty unbiased. For example, we never quote uh, the fact, we never mentioned the fact that the tributaries have been treated or not. And that could be a bias, for example, for the flashing effect they could have. What are the, the factors we could consider, in your opinion, in an investigation to make it really unbiased? Because if not 10 years from now, we'll be talking about the same things, smashing our head against the wall. I, I agree with you. You see, uh, what I think uh, one of the most important things uh, is because we are all running after the wavelengths and uh, that, you know, it's uh, more absorption, more water, bigger wavelength. And in my clinical practice, we have done uh, like 100 cases. I hardly see a slightly more gentle, I will say 1940 as compared to 1470. But if you don't tell me that it has been done, if I am blinded, on an ultrasound and to the patient, I may not be able to tell the difference at all between uh, 1470 and 1940 at all. And uh, so I personally feel uh, one is we should take this factor out of the picture. So one study we should do is uh, comparison of 1470, 1940 in the same group of patient, same level of energy, so that all the factors, other, all the other factors are taken off. Because if you look into all the comparative studies which has been published, there is a difference in something. In some factor, they have used more long softness, they have used ASSV, they have more diameters, uh, more thicker, you know, all the factors are included. So even if we have a smaller number of patients, but if you have the same factors, including because occlusion of the vessel will depend upon the diameter of the vessel, the uh, vessel wall thickness, uh, it will also depend upon, you know, the patient ferritin level because uh, it will depend upon, you know, how, how good the hemoglobin levels are. It will depend upon the color of the skin uh, if we are doing the transdermal, but we are talking endovenous. So it will depend upon uh, how much wattage we are using, how much energy we are using in the patient, what wavelength we are using. So if we have only the one same factor, so if you just have one wavelength factor difference and we do one study, and if we can show that there is no difference, at least one thing is out. And then I think we should work on 
how uh, how we can increase the delivery of energy from the laser fiber to the vein wall so there should be an experimental studies on the animals or on the veins where we can see how we can increase the delivery of energy from the laser catheter up to the vein wall media so we want to damage the media of the we want to damage the collagen basically so we, how we can increase that so i think all the studies should be pointed out that because if we can find uh, a way by which we can deliver more energy there into the vein wall uh, we will be winning the situation you know it doesn't depend upon what wavelength we are using or what what we are using i think sure. If I can just ask a second thing, since we have also Mark Weidler, that is a huge expert yeah. on this, uh, how much does it matter the thickness, of course, of uh, the of the wall in the different effects, particularly if you are talking about the small saphenous vein? Because if you look at the Cochrane, we have uh, now data showing that we could just say at one year, follow up better performance of lasers over surgery. But if we translate this into the small saphenous vein, do you have, uh, you and Raul, uh, some suggestions for us if, uh, for example, lowering the lead with 1940 could be potentially less dangerous because we are delivering less lead in that case or not for the small stuff in Spain? Do you speak low from first? Ah, it's a difficult question. <laughs> you know, uh, if you look into this, I feel, yes, uh, we, uh, why we feel, uh, if you look into the histological study published by this gentleman, I feel 1940, uh, we use less energy and uh, how uh, I still, I, if you look into the laser physics, I still can't understand uh, how lesser energy will cause you uh, better heat delivery to the vein wall. This I still cannot understand. But we think that if we are able to close the vein with a lesser energy, then there is less perivenous damage and then there is less nerve damage then there may be a you know, reason that uh, we may have less nerve damage uh, with 1940 as compared to 1470. Uh, you know, this is all theoretical, I'm thinking. Um, you know, but uh, said that, you know, we have been using 1470 from eight, nine years uh, in short saphenous vein also. So we, I, I remember only we had one single case of mild paresthesia for two weeks. And uh, so, you know, I really don't know, we can uh, speak to the high volume centers, uh, how many cases of short softness vein uh, laser ablation paresthesia they had. Thank you so much. We, we've been doing, so if I can answer this as well, just the, from, we've done a lot of work, as you know, on the ex vivo uh, grid speed vein and heat transference. And uh, what, one of the interesting things, and I think this goes to a lot of what, what I was saying earlier on, is a lot of people are just looking at the LED and forgetting that you can get the same LED with two different powers just by changing your pullback. And heat distribution, just the same way as we always talk about it's cooking a steak, very, very hot, put it on quickly, you do charcoal and nothing cooked through, but the same amount of energy, but much slower at a lower level, no charcoal and it cooks the whole the state through that's i mean we've talked about that for 20 years and i've produced some figures in my book about um the different curves we see of that and i think the answer of this is it it's the you sometimes counterintuitively it's better to lower the power to put it back slower to avoid charcoal formation by having lower powers but just do it slower and you get a better penetration of heat through the wall, whatever that formation, however you get the heat, you get it through the wall, you don't get heat lost by charcoal. And what the research we've done looking at immunocytochemistry is you get more cell death right to the outside. What you don't want to do, of course, is you don't want to do it so much that you get the heat going out to where the nerves and the skin are. So there's that balance between not doing it too fast and furious and only getting charcoal on the inside and not treating the vein versus doing it too slow. And so it, it's all about understanding heat dynamics, which is both power but also time. Thank you so much, guys. No, great. Now, I think uh, Dr. Canetta wants to have a comment too. Yeah, my, my, comment, my comment is uh, I, I saw those two presentations, one from Raghul and the other from Mark this morning. I was amazing regarding about the new way that we're supposed to change it. 
Long time ago, we just just do the pullback slowly. Now it has to just, as he said before, we have to move just a little bit faster, not too slow, not too fast. Try not to burn the skid and get the carbonization that we usually can have if we are in trouble over there. The slide that you saw, Mark, this morning was amazing regarding about how was the histologic changes and what is the difference. And this is the difference that we have to start working on it. The heat the difference on wavelength, the difference on the fibers, and we have to try to try and show the difference, try to have a better results for our patients. I think this is amazing. And I ask just a question for you guys, for you, Rabul, and for you, Mark. Do you prefer trying to do the fast pullback or the low pullback? And what is the your your su suggestion for us? It's a very uh, you see in my practical purpose, uh, I'm using an ultrasound actually. So um, so I'm I'm trying to uh, measure the length of the wing and uh, approximately estimate at how much energy I'm going to deliver in this sort of vein. And then I'm seeing the ultrasound, the vein wall, and, uh, and trying uh, to just uh, burn the thickness of the vein wall, which you can see, you know, and you can see all the time the bubbles traveling into the vein wall. And uh, so I'm just trying to burn the vein. And every 10 centimeter, I see approximately how much energy I have given. I hope I'm not given less energy. I, I, I also think that you, you, the most important thing as well just said uh, in his talk, you must avoid carbon. And I think the most important thing is you, you, if the most energy you can, which doesn't cause carbon, I think once you start causing carbonization, you're losing energy and also you're concentrating it in the wrong area of the vein. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> having said that, I'm going to be very unscientific now, and because I have nurses working with me, um, I set all my lasers to, four, uh, to 10 watts. I don't think it's the best, but it makes the mathematics easier. I think probably for 1470, for a good laser, probably six watts or eight watts is better, and to pull it back slower. But the difficulty is as soon as you start changing things, somebody might alter a setting and a patient gets a bad response. So for practical reasons and not science reasons, I always use 10 watts. But I think you're right. I think it would probably be uh, more precise. I think, we should worry about, I think we should worry about results, not time, is basically. You have a point. Uh, 